Well, hey, everybody. It is Saturday, September 23rd. And it's time for a what if stream. Happy to see all you guys here. We have a lot to do today. We are going to open this thing, uh, look at the box, I'll open it, unbox it, go over every single card. And off the side, I'm going to sleeve the cards as I go, because obviously they're not sleeved yet. And hopefully I get that all done. So yeah, uh, what's cool about this set is not only is it based on the What If Disney Plus show, which if you haven't watched, spoilers for that show, obviously. But uh, you should go watch it. It's wonderful. And it'll enhance the uh, experience of this set for sure. But also because it is a Marvel Studios set, and it's a core set, so there's 350 cards. There are not only more cards, but because it's a Marvel Studios set, there are more unique cards because um, we're not in a situation where individual art has to be commissioned. It's just uh, images from the show, which, by the way, do look great, but you can have more of them. Uh, let's go ahead and open this thing up. Well, first, here's the box. Look how beautiful it looks. Um, you can tell it fits here. Let me zoom out for a second just so you can see the, uh, the size of this box. It is... The size it is. So there's our uh, Thanos versus the Avengers playmat, which you won't see for long because there is a playmat in here. I'm going to swap it out with. Let's unbox this thing. Um, this is the front of the box. Let's flip to the back. And there is the back. Welcome to the stand the newest standalone set for Legendary, a Marvel deck building game. You will explore a prism of endless possibilities from the Marvel Cinematic Universe as you ponder the question, what if? A single choice can branch out into infinite realities, creating alternate worlds from the one you know. Alternate reality versions of fan favorite heroes team up to foil the schemes of masterminds and defeat villains from across the multiverse. Get started in the world of Legendary or add Captain Carter, T'Challa, Star-Lord, Party Thor, and many more from what if to your existing collection. Shows how much is in there. Compatible with other legendary products, of course. Follow Upper Deck on their socials. And there's a few cards that are in the set. All right, let's go ahead and open it up right now. Plastic. And uh, see what's inside. I heard this box opens in kind of an unusual way. So that should be an interesting uh, discovery here. So let's check it out. Here we go. Oh, yeah, there. Look, it opens as it's hinged. So I'm going to turn it sideways here. It hinges this way. Look at that very interesting so it's connected very cool all right there is our rule book I'll set that aside for now we will be going over the whole thing so I hope you like rules and here's the play mat I recently learned the sub animation is Hulk's tidal wave move from Marvel vs. Capcom yep those are them and uh, here are the card packs who's on them it's uh there's Captain Carter on that one and it's probably a duplicate pack because you know repeats of cards then we've got a small one with uh Ooh, there's the, one of our masterminds, Hank Pym. And then the last pack is more Captain Carter. Looks like what's supposed to be there. You got, um, ooh, these are pretty big foam blocks. I expected multiples of the small ones. So one, two, three foam blocks there. And the gorgeous playmat this comes with. So let me take a second to swap out the playmat before we go over the rules because that's only appropriate here. Um, foam cubes. I, I am probably, I'm weird. I get very excited about new foam cubes. And these are more foam rectangular prisms, but I'm still very excited. And uh, that is the box. I'll put that to the side. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful box, beautiful mat. <laughs> I guess you could use them as a tiny cushion. Uh, okay, so um, I'm going to sw uh, swiftly, quickly swap out this mat as we go over the rule book. I, I guess I can just put it on top instead of just uh, doing that. Oh, no, actually, I should, I should move it because you can see my white table. Look at that. I'm going to move it because it'll raise up the uh, close-up mat a little too much. Put that in a safe place. And here we are. Look at that. Let me zoom out. I got to zoom out for this one. Look at that. You can't even see the whole thing. But it is gorgeous. The whole uh, nebulous theme of it. Oh, I love this so much. Um, yeah, there it is. There's great photos of it, by the way, uh, online from other folks who got it. Full, uh, full photos. But it's, it's got to be my new favorite playmat. It's wonderful. So let me go ahead and uh, zoom in and adjust this to where I need it to be. Um, what's cool is I uh, I mocked this up when we saw the first image of it from Gen Con. And uh, the watcher, the way I have my stream set up, he's going to be looking in from the left just a little bit my entire game. So it's a little bit, uh, you know, it's rolled up. So I got to flatten it out a little bit. Montax with a sub. New playmat. Montax, I'd love to hear about your uh, experience playtesting this or playtesting for the first time too. Um, there we go. So the watcher gets to look in here. I gotta adjust the focus now. Uh, but let me adjust my little Avengers mat down here. You guys have no idea just how much mat adjustment I have to do for these streams. Oh, a lot of adjustment, but it's worth it. Pretty cool. So let me 
put these down here. We'll go over the rule book. My first playtest of this set too. Hello Nation, welcome to the stream and glad to have another playtester here. If you're not in the Discord, you should come by. We got, we're collecting all the playtesters in there. So, does anybody have a best practice to how to open these packs? Because sometimes I just, I just brute force them this way. Um, sometimes I have to use scissors, but I'm always nervous because I don't want to cut the cards. And uh, I'll, I'll go through the cards real quick and then we'll go in. <laughs> Tiny flamethrower. Ah, uh, that, that would be brutal. One, two. There's nothing like the smell of new playing cards, isn't there? I resorted to biting them open before. Yeah, I guess how desperate you are. <laughs> that is true. Yeah, so there is a groove on the back. It's right here, but I can never get it to work. It always works better for you to just attack the, the, the seams on the side. For whatever reason, that little groove is just not compatible with me. Uh, I don't know why. So it's the smaller pack. So look, I, I go for the groove. And I can't, yeah, there it is. There's one, two here. Yeah, right here. I, I can never get it. I can never, ever get it. It's just a me problem. So I just I just go for the uh, for the edges and it usually works. All right, so here we go. Let me go, let's go through the cards real quick. See, we know who's there, but I want to see what order they're in. So there's Captain Carter, Doctor Strange, Supreme. I want to make sure I touch all the cards, of course, before I do anything. Ooh, these cards look even better in person. Hard to describe. But, uh, okay, there's our agent with Coulson on it. On this pack, there's Maria as our trooper. There's Nick Fury. There's Strange's Demons. Yeah, these co these colors pop. Wow. All right, there's some henchmen. Got a lot of henchmen. Three henchmen in this. There's our new bystander, our standard bystander. There's our new wound. Ooh, and there's the uh, amazing scheme twist. All right. So... Yeah, uh, it's very nice that uh, there is no MCU logo on these cards, or yeah, or what if logo on these cards. Um, don't count on it. Staying away for the next set with uh, Ant Man and the Wasp, but uh, those twists are so cool. And I'm gonna go show close up to everything. By the way, speaking of Captain Metroidica here, if you would like to see images of all these cards on your own time, just go to legendarycardgame.com, and there he's already got all the card images up there for your review. Oh no! Oh no! The Watcher didn't tell me about this. Okay, if that keeps happening, I'm going to get very frustrated. All right, there's Party Thor. There's Killmonger, Spec Ops. And there's... Should I pronounce that Spec Ops or Special Ops? Uh, we got uh, Apocalyptic Black Widow. Then... <laughs> yeah, I got it. I usually touch the veggies I'm going to get, you know? So, anyway. Uh, then there's more Watcher in this pack. Oh, Rot Watcher's Rare Happy Hogan. The Special Bystanders, which are a lot of fun. And then there's our cool Master Strikes with... Ultron Infinity and more twists. There's some schemes there, which we'll get to in a moment. And this last little pack here has the following. So there's Hank Pym and his tactics, Killmonger and his tactics, Zombie Scarlet Witch and her tactics, and then Ultron Infinity and his tactics, followed by more Strange's Demons. Uh, we got the Intergalactic Party Animals here. I can't wait to try all of these. The Zombie Avengers are here as well. And uh, the rival overlords to close out that stack. So there we go. All right. Now I'm going to grab my bunch of uh, sleeves and start sleeving as we read the rule book. We'll see if I can manage this together. All right. Let's check out our focus. We're focused pretty well. How's the focus look to you guys? I think it's pretty good. I don't really want to mess with it. All right. Uh, overview. Welcome to the What If set of Legendary. We're reading this whole thing. So strap in. A Marvel deck building game. This set is based on the hit Disney Plus animated series Marvel What If, which is part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe and inspired by the classic Marvel What If comic series. Uatu the Watcher looks across the parallel realities of the multiverse, witnessing horrifying turning points in different dimensions. We are here. What if Killmonger betrayed and murdered both T'Challa and Tony Stark? Of course, spoilers for the show. If you hadn't watched the show, I don't know why you're here, but I love you anyway. All right. What if Killmonger betrayed and murdered both T'Challa and Tony Stark? What if the Noble Avengers became flesh-eating zombies? What if Ultron gained all six Infinity Stones, conquered his Earth, and then invaded the entire multiverse? To overcome them, the Watcher breaks his oath not to interfere, gathering heroes from alternate dimensions where their fates hinged on key turning points of their own. What if Peggy Carter took the Super Soldier Serum instead of Steve Rogers, gaining all the powers of Captain America? What if T'Challa was kidnapped from Earth to become Star-Lord instead of becoming Black Panther? What if Doctor Strange gave into temptation and stole the souls of demons to resurrect his lost love? Checking out chat real quick. Envious of those who have the copy already. The set looks so good. It does. I'm glad I waited till I was here with you to open it up. Here we go. Every time you play Legendary, the game itself fights back against you with a different dark mastermind pursuing a different evil scheme. 
Only you can stop them by recruiting heroes, fighting villains, and eventually challenging the mastermind themselves. Each player from one to five players starts with their own deck of basic hero cards. Uh, yep, you know that. At the start of your turn, you play the top card of the villain deck, showing how villains invade the city, capture bystanders, and create special events. Then you play hero cards in your hand to generate attack, recruit, and special abilities. You use your attack to fight villains. You use recruit to get stronger heroes to improve your deck. Whenever your deck runs out of cards and you need more, you shuffle your discard pile to make a new deck, including all the new heroes you recruited. This way, your deck gets stronger and stronger over time. Build up enough attack, and you can fight the evil mastermind. But be careful, if the players can't or don't defeat that evil genius quickly enough, then the mastermind will complete their dark scheme, win the game for evil, and all players lose. Important section right here. What's new in What If? Skip this section if this is your first time playing Legendary. This set is 100% compatible with all Legendary expansions. If you are already comfortable with the Legendary deck building game, then you don't need to read this What If rulebook. You can find rules for the keyword abilities in the What If set on page 16. But we're going to do our due diligence and read all this stuff because it's cool to know what the changes are in case you don't know. If you are familiar with Legendary, here are some key updates. There is an updated quantity of card stacks to use for each number of players to give games with a larger number of players more time to win. Love that. Four to five players now use a warm-up round to reduce early villain escapes. There is now a starting HQ mulligan. If multiple cards in the starting HQ cost seven or more, solo mode no longer plays an extra card from the villain deck after each master strike. In solo, two henchmen start the game already in the city. The solo mode villain deck now gives about four extra turns before running out, page 23, and uh, new alternate game modes in quote page 25. So um, on this solo mode point, uh, Travel Size did an excellent video going over the changes to solo mode. If you had previously played Advanced Solo in Legendary, uh, go search for Legendary Leagues on YouTube or check the uh, YouTube videos channel in the Discord. You can find that video. Yeah, I'm excited to use the mulligan. I always, by principle, didn't because it wasn't a rule, and now I kind of feel like I have license to do it. But please go check out Travel's video on the uh, solo rules. It's really concise to the point and uh, displays exactly the, what the changes are. Um, all right, and uh, this new alternate game mode, by the way, spoiler alert, it's just two-handed solo, or multiple-handed solo, which I learned later. How to win, and a lot of this is going to be repeat, but again, we're going to see if anything's different. Players must work together to fight the evil mastermind four times. Each fight takes one of the mastermind's four face-down tactic cards. When the mastermind has no more tactics, the players have won the game. Fighting villains and rescuing bystanders along the way earns players, each player, additional victory points. If the mastermind is defeated, then all players win a group victory, and the player of... Nope, the player with the most victory points is the most legendary hero of all. How the Evil Mastermind wins. Unlike other games in Legendary, the game fights back against the players. This is, by the way, what I love about Legendary so much. The Evil Mastermind, like Hank Pym, Yellow Jacket, or Ultron Infinity, isn't played by a player. Instead, the game plays itself plays part of the, master, the part of the Mastermind. The Mastermind works to accomplish an evil scheme throughout the game. Every scheme card has an evil wins condition, which tells you how the Mastermind completes their scheme. If the evil scheme is completed, then the Mastermind wins the game for evil, and all the players lose. If this happens, then the victory points don't matter and no player wins. Don't let that happen. On to page three. Your first game. What to do for your first game. Here's a suggested uh, first game. Looks like the mastermind is Hank Pym. The scheme is collect an interstellar zoo, and it uses a certain amount of heroes and, and villains for different players. So check that out. You can screenshot this if you want. But uh, my first game is going to be a bit different today. And uh, there's a little picture of the mat, which is great. Moving on to page five. And I'll abridge this part, too, because we know how this works. So the game setup has eight agents and four troopers, and you can see the new ones here. The always available decks, but each of these decks on their space in the, on the playmat use all the cards you own of each type. Shield officers, bystanders, and wounds. Special bystanders are shuffled in with the other bystanders. Decks of all identical cards can stay face up. Decks containing different cards should be shuffled face down. I don't think that exact wording was present before, even though I think we all knew that was the case. So um, if it was present... Um, apologies, but uh, that is that is it. All right, Captain Carter's car decided to fall down, so stop doing that. Uh, here we go. Uh, mastermind and scheme. Pick one mastermind at random. Put it on the mastermind space under the play mat. Tuck its four matching mastermind tactic cards underneath it, face down in random order. All the masterminds in this set are double sided, with a normal side and a harder epic side. For most games, you'll want to use the normal non-epic side we are only going to be using non-epics today because i only have time for four games i barely even have time for four games but i'm going to do it and uh, that would be four more games for epics but we will be fighting these epic ones in the randomizer league and other times rest assured so pick one scheme card at random place it face up on the scheme space each scheme has a setup that specifies how many twists to use 
Put that mini scheme twist cards onto the villain deck space. Some schemes also change the number of heroes or villain groups to use or specify other special rules. And there's a display of the card type and all that stuff. There's the awesome twist. Villain deck. Add all five Master Strike cards to the villain deck. Add villain groups and henchmen groups to the villain deck. A quote villain group is a set of eight villain cards that work together like Zombie Avengers or Strange's Demons. Each villain card lists its villain group under its card name. There you go. To add villain groups, the more players you have in the game, the more villain groups you use as shown in this game setup table. The only change here is to solo, I believe. Well, maybe not. No, there's more bystanders for other groups. Um, and it's shown later, but who can tell me what the difference is for the uh, more than uh, more than three players? Because I don't remember exactly. Um, for the uh, solo, it's a uh, one henchman group of two cards in deck and two cards in the city. You'll see that in a little bit. Each mastermind card says that the mastermind always leads a particular villain group or henchman group. Included as one of the groups you add to the villain deck, pick the remaining villain and henchman groups at random. The always leads in this set are very strange. It's a very eclectic group of always leads compared to other sets. For each villain group you pick, add all eight villain cards from that villain group to the villain deck. Off the cuff, thank you. Extra villain group for four to five players. Yep, perfect. It used to be three, three, four, I believe. That was three, four, five. Love to see that. For each henchman group, add the 10 identical henchman villain cards from that henchman group to the villain deck. You know what that means, by the way, off the cuff? Um, I have to update every single legendary adventure path, so uh, I don't want to think about that right now. In one player solo games only, add only two cards from the chosen henchman group to the villain deck. Add two, mo uh, two more cards from that same henchman group enter the city before your first turn. Do not use the remaining six cards. And we'll check that out on page 23. To, right? <laughs> to add bystanders. Maybe I'll get some help with that. To add bystanders, check the game setup table on page 6 to see how many cards from the bystander deck to add to the villain deck. By random chance, some of the cards might be special bystanders. <laughs> hero deck. There are 8 different heroes in Legendary What If. There are 14 cards for each of these heroes. Make the hero deck this way. Check the game setup table, page 6, to see how many heroes you should add. Pick the number of heroes from all the heroes you have. For each of those heroes, add 14, all 14 cards that, from that hero for that hero to the hero deck. And it might say this later in the set, but uh, the MCU sets, including What If, have a different card distribution. They have six different cards per hero instead of four, uh, but we probably get into that later. Completing setup, shuffle the hero deck, put it face down on the hero deck's face, put five cards from the hero deck face up into the five HQ spaces, shuffle the villain deck, place it face down on the villain deck's face. Each player shuffles their own personal deck and draws a hand of six cards from it. All right, here's the new, uh, new section about the starting HQ mulligan. If there are at least two cards in the starting HQ that cost seven or more, we lovingly call those ultimates. Then all players can agree to mulligan those HQ space uh, HQ spaces like this. Set aside all cards that cost seven or more from the HQ. Refill those HQ spaces, setting aside any other heroes that cost seven or more that appear during any of these refills. Once the HQ is full, shuffle the set aside heroes back into the hero deck. Do this only during game setup. You can't mulligan once the game has already started. This helps avoid overly expensive starting HQs. So yeah, it seems that if you do mulligan, you end up with no rares in the hero deck at all. And uh, this way it doesn't cause you to do a second mulligan because that's how it ends. What do you guys think of that rule? I like it. I kind of always wanted to do it, but now it's official. So I kind of feel like I have license to do, to do it like I mentioned earlier. I think it's great. Plus, you don't have to if you don't want to. All right, let's go ahead and move on to how to play. Is there anything new? Yes, yeah, so we know how to play. What Step one, play, uh, I'll just read it. To choose a random player to go first. Players take turns in clockwise order. On your turn, do three things. Um, has Have they mentioned that players go in clockwise order in previous core sets specifically? I don't, probably, probably. I just haven't mentioned. I uh, haven't uh, paid attention to that. Number one, play the top card of the villain deck. Number two, play cards in your hand, using them to fight and recruit. Step three, discard your hand and draw six new cards. Step one, play the top card of the villain deck. Play the top card of the villain deck face up. What you do with that card depends on what kind of card it is. There are four kinds of cards in the villain deck. Villains, bystanders, master strikes, and scheme twists. It gives better recruit early recruit options instead of having to get officers, so I like it. I like it too. If I know that there's heroes in the setup that have a lot of recruit and might leave it, I like that there's the option. All right, here's the warm-up round info. Four to five players, warm-up round. In four to five player games only, there is a warm-up round where on each player's first turn, they do not play a card from the villain deck. On every turn after that, play the top card of the villain deck as normal. This gives larger player groups more time to get their decks going before the villains start invading. This is a wonderful change in my opinion. I used to do this. Uh, I, I, I still do it. I guess I will continue to still do it, uh, do it because it's a rule now. Um, my difference is I gave five players two free turns, but this is very fair. Um, 
it the city gets very out of control with four to five players because it's a four four to five turns before they get to do anything really. Actually, ten turns because their second hand is the other half of their starting deck. So that's wonderful. If the villain deck card is a villain, that villain invades the city. Here are the different parts of a villain card. Note, henchmen villains are villains too. Um, so remember that, in case you don't know. Villain moves into the city. Move the new villain to the city space closest to the villain deck. That city space is labeled sewers. Villains in the city are always face up. Uh, this is important because if you're playing on the villains mat, you still move the villain to the city space closest to the villain deck, but that would be the bridge. Push other villains forward if necessary. Each of the five city spaces can only hold one villain. Whenever a villain enters a city space, if it's if there's already another villain there, then that existing villain gets pushed forward one space to make room. So a single villain entering the city sometimes causes a chain reaction of several villains getting pushed forward. Remember, only push a villain forward if it needs to move to make room for another villain entering that space. You might see me make a mistake and push a villain early and then put it back just because logistics, but don't do that. A villain might escape. If a villain gets pushed off the final fifth city space, then that villain escapes the city and goes into the escape pile on the playmat face up. When a villain escapes, follow these steps. And it's the regular steps, I believe. Um, I'm just going to abridge this part. If the escaping uh, the escaping villain KOs a hero that costs six or less from the HQ, and then if the escaping villain had any captured bystanders, then each player must discard a card from their hand as a penalty for not rescuing them. The and then number three, if the escaping villain has an escape effect on its card, do what it says. The important part of this section is that these things happen in order. So first, you KO the hero that costs six or less. Second, the bystander discard. And third, the escape effect does happen in that order. Then we've got a section about ambush effects. If a villain has an ambush effect, do what it says now if it comes into the city at that point. Remember, make sure that the newly entering villain has fully moved into the sewers, pushing any other villains forward as necessary before doing its ambush ability. If another villain was pushed out of the city and escaped when this new villain entered the city, handle all the escape effects for the am escaping villain before handling any ambush effect for the new villain. This is a good thing to remember for everybody, even if you've been playing Legendary for a while, you do handle the escape effects before the new ambush effects. If the villain deck card is a bystander, this innocent or the innocent bystander is captured by a villain. Tuck the bystander face up under the villain in the city that's closest to the villain deck. If there are no villains in the city, then the bystander is captured by the mastermind. Make sure the bystander pokes out a bit so players can't see it. Key part is, you do place it there face up. Whenever a villain with any bystanders moves to a new city space, it carries all those bystanders along with it to the new city space. It's up to the players to rescue bystanders. When a player fights a villain or mastermind with any bystanders, any bystanders, that player rescues all bystanders under that villain or mastermind and puts them into their personal victory pile. Each bystander is worth one victory point. So the more bystanders you rescue, the more victory points you earn. Some special bystanders also say they give you extra rewards when you rescue this bystander. Those are fun. Something I'll mention, I did skip over this. Uh, upon an escape, no matter how, it says it right here, each player only discards one card when a villain carries away bystanders, no matter how many bystanders it carried away. That's very important. Okay, let's look at these cool strikes and twists. Uh, they basically work the same. Uh, if a villain deck card is a master strike, a master strike representing the evil mastermind... No! Emerging from their lair to get their hands dirty and smash the heroes themselves, each mastermind has their own specific master strike. When a master strike is played from the villain deck, look at the master strike effect on the mastermind card and do what it says... Put the Mastermind in the KO pile unless the effect says to put it somewhere else. So a Scheme Twist card represents the evil scheme moving forward towards victory for the Mastermind. Every scheme works in a completely different way with its Scheme Twist doing a specific thing related to that scheme. Oh, when the Scheme Twist is played, look at the Twist effect on the main Scheme card and do what it says. Some twists say they do something special when Twist 1 or Twist 4 to 6 come up. Put the Scheme Twist in the KO pile unless the scheme tells you to put it somewhere else. Important note, villains in the city don't get pushed forward when the card played from the villain deck is a bystander, master strike, or scheme twist. Resist any... Yes, Zedai, we talked about that. Resist any temptation to push villains forward before revealing the card from the villain deck. Quick question for those in chat. Is there anybody here who... Um, what if will be their very first legendary set? It will be kind of cool if it is, so let me know if that's you. Gaining wounds and other cards. If a player gains a particular card, that means put that card into that player's discard pile. For example, gain a wound means put a card from the wound deck into your discard pile. I love how it says wound deck because we have grievous wounds. Um, Devin actually answered my question a bit, bit ago about what's a, what's a stack, what's a deck. But yes, so a deck is anything that usually has hidden information and is face down because of that. So we have a wound deck, bystander deck, everything's a deck right now um, if you use special cards. Step two, play cards from your hand using them to fight and recruit. It's a way of life, it is. 
Um, the only types of cards that you can typically be in your hand, that can typically be in your hand, are heroes and wounds. Heroes are the, here are the different parts of a hero card. And uh, we were talking about this description in the other set. So let's be specific. Um, hero class icon slash color. And then, yep, that's uh, both of those things. The team is not labeled, and I never know why this is. But recruit points, attack points, cost, special ability, and hero name. That is the team icon. Probably uh, it's somewhere else that it's labeled. After you play the top card of the villain deck, it's time to play the cards from your hand. Some of your cards produce attack points that let you fight villains. Other cards produce recruit points that let you gain more heroes. Many cards also give you powerful special abilities. I, have, I don't think I've seen this breakdown in this exact way before, so let's just read through it. Play each card in your hand in any order, one at a time. Each time you play a card, do what the card says. You get attack. You get any attack points listed in its attack icon. You also get any recruit points listed in its recruit icon. Keep the cards you play in front of you until the end of your turn. To make it easier to count up your attack points and recruit points, you can line up all the attack icons as you go so that you can read all the attack points in a row. You can do the same with lining up your recruit points. That's a great tip, and I do use that often. You can play all your cards, building up a pool of attack cards and recruit points before deciding which enemies to fight and which heroes to recruit. And let's read this special rule here about the uh, special numbers. Numbers like 2 plus or 2 asterisk. Some cards have numbers like 2 plus inside the recruit icon. The 2 means that you always get at least 2 recruit from that card. The plus symbol means that you might have even more recruit based on what the card says in its special ability. Heroes attack icons and enemies attack icons can have numbers like 2 plus 2 working the same way. Likewise, some hero and enemy cards and other sets have a number with an asterisk, like two recruit in or two asterisk inside one of their icons. This means the card special abilities tell you something especially important about how to use that card's attack, recruit, or cost. So it's crucial to check its special abilities. It doesn't mean multiplication or a variable. I'm really liking how this core set is so thorough, and uh, I guess that makes sense for the most recent core set uh, rulebook. It is now the official uh, go-to rulebook. Superpower abilities. Some cards have a superpower ability with a hero class color icon and a colon like strength or green you get plus one attack you may use that superpower ability if you only if you have already played another card of that color earlier in your turn i see this question come up a lot you know, for new players so remember that it's very important you have had to have played another card of that color before you can activate another card that has that superpower ability. A card's color is shown in the hero class icon in the card's upper left, and also in the color of the card's border. Each hero has a rare card with no border. You can see a rare card's color by checking the hero class icon. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's wild that this game has not only been around for 10 years, but it's getting even better, I think. Uh, that's wild. Um, some superpowers use a team icon like Guardians of the Multiverse instead of a hero class icon. These work the same way as superpowers use that color icons. That that use color icons. A card's team icon is in the card's upper left corner. Important! You can only use a card's superpower ability once, even if you played multiple cards of that color that turn. However, a few superpower abilities will be will explicitly tell you to count a number of cards played earlier in the turn, like tech. You get plus one attack. For each other tech hero you played this turn. That one's very important. I see that uh, asked a lot as well. You have to... Uh, that only counts the ones you played before that card is played. Because that's when the effect happens. Here we go. Um, the more heroes of the same color or the same team you recruit the deck, the more often you'll be able to use superpower abilities. A deck focusing on one or two colors can be very powerful. Very true. Some superpower abilities require things like ranged ranged or... Tech Instinct. To use these, you must have played two ranged cards or played a tech card and played a instinct card earlier in the turn. Bonus points for the first person that tells me what the Dark City rulebook called this kind of effect. I still like it. Even though the name's not being used, I like the name. It's fun. Uh, yeah, 11 years now. And and counting. Look at that. Let's, uh, and there, there's your example right there. You got five attack there, plus two from the effect, and then seven. Yeah, Travel got it. Critical hit. I love that name. I'm never going to stop using it. <laughs> Example of superpower abilities, Killmonger's Violence Leaves Scars card, shown here, always gives you three attack when you play it, even if you don't have any other green strength hero cards. But if you have already played another green card earlier in the turn, then you may use Killmonger's superpower ability to get an additional two attack. There are two different villain groups in your victory pile, so that gives you seven attack in total. The green card you played earlier in the turn could be a green party Thor card, another green Killmonger card, or even another copy of Violence Leaves Scars. If you play two Violence Leaves Scars as your first two cards of the turn, you won't get to use the superpower ability for the first Violence Leaves Scars card you play this turn, but you will get to use this superpower for the second Violence Leaves Scars card you play this turn. 
So you would get eight attack total. Every time I say violence leaves scars card, I, I feel like I'm saying Alexander Skarsgård and um, I'm not. Fighting villains and recruiting heroes. In between playing cards from your hand and or after you've played all of your cards, you may, you can fight any number of villains and recruit any number of heroes. You can play cards, fight and recruit any number of times in any order in the same turn. How to fight a villain? If you've ever wanted to know, now you can know. How do you fight a villain here? As you play villains from your hand, you generate a pool of attack points. You can spend these to fight villains in the city one at a time. You can only fight a villain if you have at least as many attack points remaining as that villain's attack number. You don't have to match up specific heroes you play against specific villains. It doesn't matter which city space holds the villain. To fight a villain, one, spend attack points equal to that villain's attack to put that villain into your personal victory pile. Also, rescue any bystanders underneath, placing them into your victory pile. Two, this is in all bold, it's very important. If a villain has a fight effect on it, do what it says. Also, do any when you rescue this effect on bystanders you rescue this way. Do these fight and rescue effects in any order. Another confirmation that you can choose whether you do a fight effect or a bystander rescue effect first. And that does matter in a lot of cases, and I always forget, so I'll try not to. You can also fight the Mastermind, see page 14. There's a bit of an update to the KO section, too. Many card effects tell you to KO a card, meaning knock out. Put that card into the shared face-up KO pile off to the side of the playmat. These cards are permanently knocked out of the game. Permanently in quotes, because they might come back under certain conditions. Um, getting your starting shield heroes KO'd is often actually often helpful since it means you will draw your more powerful heroes more often instead of drawing the weaker shield heroes note if a card says to ko quote one of your heroes that could be a hero you've already played this turn or a hero still in your hand if you ko a hero you've already played this turn you still get to use the recruit attack and special abilities that hero produced by the way i'm sure reading a lot of words if you are new to this game and anything was confusing from what i read from the rulebook please bring it up well uh, we'll talk about it Victory piles. Each player has their own... Uh, there's a change to this one, too. I like this. Has their own personal victory pile. It holds all the villains they have fought and all the bystanders they have rescued. Villains and bystanders are not shuffled into your deck. Keep your victory pile horizontal so you don't accidentally mix it up with your discard pile. That is new and that is fun. At the end of, your, at the end of the game, villains and bystanders in your victory pile are worth the total victory points, the victory points shown on their cards. Anybody here... Uh, was anybody here keeping their victory pile horizontal this whole time? I keep mine off to the side in little card holders, so I don't quite do that, but I, I like that. <laughs> no, no, no worries. Thank you for being here. Uh, although your name did make me want pizza because of the end of it. How to recruit a hero. As you play heroes from your hand, you generate a pool of recruit points. You can spend these to recruit heroes from the HQ one at a time. You can only recruit a hero if you have at least as many recruit points remaining as that hero's cost. The HQ area of the playmat has five spaces, which always contain exactly five heroes all face up. Um, Travel says, halfway through the rules, stay on target. Yes, we're about 45 minutes in. Um, no, and I just made massive the vertical victory pile. I, I won't tell anybody, Red John. <laughs> All right, to recruit a hero. Spend recruit equal to that hero's cost to gain that hero and put it into your discard, discard pile. Remember, when you gain something, it goes to your discard pile in general. A hero's cost is in its lower right corner. When your deck runs out and you shuffle your discard pile to make a new deck, you, you will soon draw that new hero and be able to use their abilities. Then refill the empty space in the HQ with a new card from the hero deck face up. Whenever there is an empty space in the HQ for any reason, refill that space immediately this way. You can even recruit a hero, see what new hero appears in its place from the hero deck, and then potentially recruit that new hero too if you have enough recruit points. You can always spend three recruit points to recruit a shield officer from the officer deck. Um, <laughs> yeah, you'll make it just on time, Travel. Thanks for coming by. I'll see ya. And then Freckles. Yes, it is very exciting. I would not be surprised to see a What If Season 2 uh, smaller box expansion to go with this one in the future. Uh, step 3. Discard your hand and draw 6 new cards. At the end of your turn, put all the cards you played this turn into your discard pile face up. Also, discard any cards in your hand that you didn't play this turn. Then, draw 6 new cards from your deck. If your deck runs out and you still have to draw more cards, shuffle your discard pile into a new face down deck. Then, draw the rest of the cards you need. Nightbot, I'm not there yet. <laughs> Don't shuffle your discard pile into a new deck until your deck has completely run out and you still need to draw or reveal more cards. Masterminds. A mastermind is a diabolical arch enemy that pursues an evil scheme and leads the other villains. A player can choose to fight the mastermind and instead of fighting a villain, 
Nope, just instead of fighting a villain. I don't know why I said it that way. Like any other fight, you have to spend attack points equal to the Mastermind's attack to fight that Mastermind. Here's a little diagram. So, special abilities always leads, Master Strike, Attack, Victory Points, Card Type, and Name. Mastermind Tactics. Masterminds use different abilities during fights represented by Mastermind Tactic cards. All four of a Mastermind's Tactics have the same attack number, but they each have different fight effects. Uh, to fight a Mastermind, one, spend attack points equal to the Mastermind's attack, Take a random card from the face down tactics underneath the mastermind and put that tactic into your victory pile. It's worth several victory points. Also, rescue any bystanders the mastermind was holding, putting them all into your victory pile. Step two do what the fight effect on the tactic card says. Also, do any when you rescue this effects on any bystanders you rescue this way. Do these fight and rescue effects in any order. These effects may give you a reward, cause the mastermind to hit each other, each, each other player with an unwelcome effect, or power up the mastermind for the future. If a tactics fight effect somehow increases the mastermind's attack number, that will only apply for future fights. So yeah, basically the tactic goes into your victory pile, then you do the thing it says. Okay, and there's a tactic breakdown, so the card type, fight ability, name, mastermind name, victory points, and attack. A mastermind has not truly been beaten until all of their mastermind tactic cards have been fought by the players. If you draw a great hand that gives you a large pool of attack points, you can even fight the mastermind multiple times in one turn. And a lot of us use the final blow rule, which I will be using today, where you do have to hit the Mastermind a fifth and final time once all their tactics are gone. But that's not an official... It is an official rule, it's just not a base rule, it's a challenge mode. End of the game. Players win. When the Mastermind has no more tactic cards under them, the players win the game. When fighting the ma final Mastermind tactic, the current player still does that tactic's fight ability. That player may finish the rest of their turn in case they want to fight a few more villains. As soon as the Mastermind has no more tactics under them, victory is assured, and players will win the game even if the final tactics fight ability would achieve the scheme's evil win con wins condition or cause the hero deck or villain deck to run out. That's very important. You finish out the turn, even when the players win. You get to finish out the whole thing. Evil wins. Every scheme card has a part that says evil wins, which tells you how the Mastermind completes their scheme. If the evil scheme is completed, then the Mastermind immediately wins the game for evil, and all players lose. Don't finish the turn. Tide game. Oh, it's interesting. It's not called the draw. It's called the tide game, which I guess is the same thing. If either the hero deck or the villain deck ever reaches zero cards, you can finish the current turn as a final chance to win. If you have not won or lost by the end of this turn, then the game ends in a tie between good and evil. The players have successfully survived the scheme, but they didn't defeat the mastermind. The player with the most victory points wins an individual victory. Be sure to get the mastermind next time. Once the hero deck or villain deck reached zero card, has reached zero cards, then the game will end at the end of this turn, even if some card effect somehow puts cards back into the empty hero deck or villain deck. This is important. It might happen with things like uh, Sentinel Squad 1 in Messiah Complex. Note, if the scheme says that evil wins when the hero deck runs out or the villain deck, then the game is over as soon as that deck reaches zero cards. You do not finish the turn in that case. Evil has already won. Stop! End of the core rules. You now know all the rules you need to play. You can stop here and play the game. Some cards in What If have keyword abilities like Soulbind and Liberate. If you wish, you can skim the section below about the specific keyword abilities in What If. Then come back to read details as they come up in your game. The rest of this rulebook contains additional clarifications, reference material, and other game modes. You can skim through them if a question comes up or read them later for more details about the game. Go challenge the Mastermind and good luck. That's the end of the main core rules. So now we get to get into the new stuff, which is the new keywords and all the interesting things that have to do with what if. All right, let's check out these new keywords. We did get teasers of these a bit earlier after Gen Con, but I want to read the official ones. Here we go, starting with the first new keyword in this set. The set is called what if, and this first keyword is also called what if. I heard from the playtesters that it uh, took a while to get this right, but they kind of had a moment where it kind of clicked, which is interesting, but I'd love to hear more about that from anybody who tested this. Um, how was your um, experience testing the keywords that come up, starting with what if? This new keyword highlights how a hero's destiny can pivot on a single crucial choice with consequences that spill through the rest of that dimension. Some hero cards say things like, what if you get plus three recruit? This means choose a hero class or a hero name, then reveal the top card of your deck and either put it back on top of your deck or discard it. If the revealed card had the hero class or hero name you chose, then do the what if effect. What if is not allowed to trigger on zero cost gray starting cards like Shield Agent or Shield Trooper, so don't choose those hero names. Even if a what if ability misses, it's still valuable to be able to choose your top to choose to put your top card in your discard pile or not. For example, it can give you key information about your top card so you know what to choose with your next what if card that turn, or if the top card is a shield agent, you can discard it so you have a chance to hit with your next what if ability uh, that turn and you don't have to draw it next turn. 
if you choose a hero name like Black Widow, that will trigger on any card whose hero name is literally Black Widow, as well as any hero name that contains Black Widow, such as Apocalyptic Black Widow. However, you have to choose an actual hero name. You can't just you can't choose just the word Captain and trigger on both Captain America and Captain Carter cards since the single word Captain isn't a hero name. So I would imagine that things like Hulk, if you said Hulk because Hulk is a hero name and She-Hulk came up, that would work because she Hulk is within She-Hulk. Increases your chances, increasing your chances with what if. There are lots of ways you can increase the chance that your what if abilities will work. First, there are several cards in this set that let you reveal the top card of your deck or put a card on top of your deck so that you know what to choose with what if. Second, you can try focusing your deck on a single hero class or single hero name. Third, collecting lots of what if cards can let you see the top card with the first what if so that you know what to guess with the rest of your what if abilities that turn. And fourth, you can look for ways to KO your zero cost starter cards or and avoid or KO wounds. Looks very fun. Montax says, what if was definitely my favorite new keyword from this set. I am highly looking forward to checking that out. Uh, any questions? Want me to read anything else for what if? Otherwise, we're going to move on to Soulbind. In a Madden's drive to save his beloved Christine Palmer, the alternate dimension variant known as Doctor Strange Supreme, binds demons' dark souls to devour their power. This is Souls game? Watu, the Watcher, and Gamora also make crucial moves to bind certain souls and infinity stones. This is represented with the new Soulbind keyword. Some cards say things like, Ranged Soulbind, you get plus attack equal to that villain's printed victory points. Um, side note, I just finished sleeving all the cards, so congrats to me. Uh, here we go. That This means if you have played a ranged hero earlier this turn, you may choose a face-up villain card from your victory pile. Turn it face down and put it on the bottom of your victory pile. If you do, then you do the listed Soulbind effect. At the end of the game, when you are counting victory points, Turn all those face down cards face up again, and you can count their victory points. But until the end of the game, the face down cards count as not being in your victory pile at all. This is a great way to stop Rise of the Living Dead villains, described on page 18, from coming back to life out of your victory pile. The face down card can't be used for another Soulbind effect later. The face down card can't help you against cross dimensional rampages, also described on page 18. It doesn't count for effects that count the number of cards or villains in your victory pile. Act as if the face down card is no longer in your victory pile at all until you are counting victory points at the end of the game. That's a very important point. They're not there, but you do get the VP, so you can't use them for Blood Frenzy or anything else. Some cards ask you to soulbind more specific things, like soulbind a henchman or soulbind six villains. Using soulbind is usually optional. You generally don't have to use soulbind if you don't want to, whether on a hero card you played or a villain you just fought. However, some cards explicitly say that you must soulbind, which means you have to do it. Um, soulbind is the one I am most looking forward to, uh, for sure, uh, and the Doctor Strange stuff with the soulbind effects. But uh, Gamora is rare with Soulbind as well, though. I can't wait to... I hope I get to use that this game, this stream. Liberate. Here we go. The third new keyword. Apocalyptic Black Widow hails from the reality where Ultron won, destroyed the other Avengers, and annihilated most of humanity. So, a good day. She re realizes that destroying replaceable robotic sentries will never win the war. Instead, she devotes herself to specific strikes on two targets, saving human hostages and destroying the Mastermind once and for all. Killmonger Special Ops likewise devotes himself to targeted rescue missions and taking out the top of the opposing command structure. This is represented by the new Liberate keyword. Some hero cards say things like Liberate 3. This means you get plus 3 attack usable only against villains holding bystanders or the Mastermind. You can use the bonus attack against the Mastermind whether it's holding bystanders or not. You can use attack that's only usable against Masterminds, like Liberate, on additional attack that Mastermind abilities ask you to spend, like when Hank Pym Yellow Jacket requires extra attack to, quote, track him down. Okay, those are the new keywords. Here are some returning keywords. Um, Empowered works just like it did in Ant-Man and Black Panther. Um, I don't think there's anything new here, but I'll read it anyway. This keyword represents heroes and villains who draw power from ambient energy technology or superpowers around them. Ultron can famously infect nearby technology to serve his own ends while tuning his robotic sentries to absorb specific kinds of energy. Some heroes say you get empowered by Covert. This means you get plus one attack for each Covert card in the HQ. On villains and masterminds, empowered by tech means this gets plus one attack for each tech card in the HQ. Uatu the Watcher is sometimes empowered by a specific hero name or hero team in the same way. As heroes enter and leave the HQ, an empowered card can get stronger or weaker. You only check the bonus at the moment you play your empowered hero or at the moment you fight the empowered enemy. 
One clever move is to recruit a hero from the HQ at the right time, changing the colors in the HQ to weaken an empowered enemy or try to strengthen an empowered hero in your hand. Abilities that let you put power uh, put cards in the HQ on the bottom of the hero deck are especially useful at manipulating empowered heroes or empowered villains. Multi-class cards are back again. Wakandans like T'Challa, Black Panther, and N'Jaka, Killmonger are famously multi-talented, combining technology, instinct, subtlety, long-range planning, and pure power. This is represented by having cards with multiple hero classes. For T'Challa in particular, his journeys across the galaxy as Star-Lord T'Challa in the What If series have only broadened his mastery over an array of skills represented by all of his cards being multi-class. Love that for the T'Challa sets. An Instinct Covert card counts as both Instinct and Covert. These cards are great at enabling superpower abilities like Covert. You get plus two attack. Cross Dimensional Rampage. From a dimension where Loki didn't grow up in Asgard, Thor never learned sacrifice or the value of honor. So all party Thor cares about is cutting loose with truly earth-shattering, earth-shaking celebrations. Gods, monsters, and aliens arrive to attend these festivities until they're a real bash with earth and ruins. This is represented with this keyword. Uh, yep, this is represented with this keyword. Yep. Uh, so this returns from Secret Wars, the Secret Wars set. And I think it's done better here than any other set that's been in. Cross-dimensional party rampage on a hero or villain means each player reveals one of their party heroes or a party card in their victory pile or gains a wound. You can reveal any card that includes the word party in its card name, hero name, villain group name, tactics, or uh, for party masterminds. This includes any party Thor hero card or any card from the intergalactic party animals villain group. How are you guys doing out there? There's a lot of words. Cross-dimensional zombie rampage and cross-dimensional demon rampage can be blocked by zombie and demon cards in the same way. You can use any card that has demon as any part of its names, including demonic descendant, demon form, cleaving demon blade, and so on. Cool, I love those uh, that clarification from other cards from other sets. Hanging on, all right, me too. When a cross-dimensional party rampage happens, you can choose to gain the wound, or even if you have a party card that you already played or could otherwise reveal, you might want to gain the wound if you have any cards that benefit from gaining wounds or a card that benefits from preventing wounds. Rise of the Living Dead. This is an existing keyword, but if uh, you don't know, there is an update to this that uh, changes a previous rule from Secret Wars. In one terrifying alternate dimension, a zombie plague overtakes the Avengers and eventually all of Earth. These zombie Avengers retain their superpowers, but have lost all their heroism, craving only the taste of flesh. Even when they are defeated, they will stagger to their feet again unless they are quickly buried. This is represented by villains with the Rise of the Living Dead keyword. You got the finale on. That's awesome. I wish I could do that, but uh, copyright rules. Rise of the Living Dead means each player checks the top card of their victory pile. If that card is a villain with, rise, with a Rise of the Living Dead ability, that villain re-enters the city. A villain that re-enters a city this way follows the same rules as any other villain escaping the city. First, check a villain is pushed out to escape uh, and resolve any escape effects, then do any ambush abilities for the arriving villain. However, this is new. However, note that a villain returning to the city because a Rise of the Living Dead ability does... Because of... Oh, no single word. Because of a Rise of the Living Dead ability does not itself bring back additional villains with its own Rise of the Living Dead ability. A single player does not do a chain reaction of many villains returning at once. However, since each player is affected by Rise of the Living Dead, several villains might still return when Rise of the Living Dead occurs, a maximum of one returning villain per player. This is a change from when this keyword appeared in Secret Wars when chain reactions were allowed. This change affects the old Secret Wars expansion cards too. Um, those who played Secret Wars, how do you feel about that change? Um, I like it, actually. When Rise of the Living Dead happens, it affects each player in order. The player whose turn it is resolves it first, including any potential escapes, then any ambush effects. When all of that is complete, then the next player in clockwise order resolves Rise of the Living Dead in the same way. So, how do you stop zombies from returning? By burying them deep. After fighting a villain with Rise of the Living Dead, look for ways to put a card that doesn't have Rise of the Living Dead on top of that zombie villain effectively burying it. That way, the next time that Rise of the Living Dead happens, nothing will return. You can do this by fighting a villain that doesn't have Rise of the Living Dead mas or a mastermind tactic or rescuing a bystander. You can also soul bind the Rise of the Living Dead card to bind the zombie's soul and prevent it from ever returning. I'm very excited to try and do that. Um, checking out chat. Um, everybody seems to like the change. I might use Ghost Racers more often now. Still dangerous. I purposely avoid this keyword. This makes you want to try it again. Great. Yeah, I'm glad we're all on the same page there. 
Mastermind tactics are never returned by Rise of the Living Dead. Zombie Scarlet Witch's tactics say fight before putting this tactic in your victory pile. Rise of the Living of the Living Dead. This means that fighting any tactic with Rise of the Living Dead can return other Rise of the Living Dead villains to the city. However, the Mastermind tactics themselves are never returned. Even if the top card of your victory pile was a different mastermind tactic with Rise of the Living Dead. Very important point there. If you put a villain with bystanders into your victory pile, you choose the order that all those cards go into your victory pile. So if you fight a Rise of the Living Dead villain that had bystanders, it's smart to put the bystanders on top. Liberate is helpful when villains have bystanders and it also helps against Rise. So there's two things that are a benefit to you for uh, with when bystanders are captured by villains here. Uh, here we go. Villains are setting to become additional masterminds. When some powerful villains in this set escape, they say that they ascend to become powerful masterminds. This means that there are multiple masterminds in the game. Players must defeat all the masterminds to win. When a master strike occurs, each mastermind does its master strike ability. The player whose turn it is picks the order. If an effect says something to the mastermind, you pick which mastermind it affects. By the way, that's a general rule in Legendary. If something says the blank and there's more than one of that thing, you get to pick a thing, usually. Um, I guess that makes Deadpool the best zombie killer. Oh yeah, um, best liberator too, I guess. Um, there's some there's some in this set that can do that. Um, and Ascending Mastermind doesn't have Mastermind Tactics. You only need to fight it once to defeat it and put it into your victory pile. Once it's in your victory pile, it's considered a villain card again, not a Mastermind or Tactic card. So um, you cannot do the final blow on an Ascended Mastermind because they don't have Tactics. You just defeat them and they're gone. Killmonger Special Ops, counting villain groups. Killmonger Special Ops says has some cards that say you get plus one attack for each different villain group in your victory pile. Henchman groups are a, are a kind of villain group, so each henchman group counts towards this number. Don't count cards turn face down by Soulbind. Again, it's like they're not there. You can't count cards that have no villain group that some special rule may have put into your victory pile, including tactics, bystanders, master strike, scheme twists, or heroes that were turned into villains. So. Don't fudge the rules on that one. Villain groups are villain groups. I'm going to try to see if I can do a core set Deadpool Liberate build at some point. Ooh, that would be fun. That would be really cool. Ultron Infinity. Ultron's abilities can let him get multiple empowered abilities. He counts each of them separately. So if he gets two empowered by covert abilities, he will get plus two attack for each covert card in the HQ. If he collects all the Infinity Stones, Ultron Infinity can get plus infinite attack. That is wild. This gives him infinity attack. This means that no amount of normal attack will be able to beat him. Depending on your heroes, you might still have a sliver of hope to defeat him with the infinity attack made by Gamora's Infinity Crusher or with another occasional hero with other occasional hero cards that say defeat the mastermind once without using attack points. The best plan is to defeat Ultron before he masters all of the infinity stones and goes infinite. So uh, this was clarified by Travel Sized and some other uh, testers. You cannot do a quote-unquote infinite combo like one with um, Electro from Villains where you would dodge over and over to build up attack points because you can never actually physically get to infinity attack. So that doesn't count as infinity attack because you, you can actually get it. So um, these are the only ways to do that. Gamora's rare or defeat a Mastermind for free or something like that. Or I guess piercing energy would work too. Details on specific card types. Shield cards are heroes. All shield agents, troopers, and officers are hero cards. Most normal shield heroes have no hero class and are the color gray. If a card effect tells you to KO one of your heroes, you can KO one of your shield cards, and that's usually a good idea. Agreed. Bystanders. Some card effects tell you to rescue a bystander. This means take the top bystander from the bystander deck and put it into your victory pile. This represents saving bystanders that are trapped or in danger from all the chaos and destruction. Each bystander in your victory pile gives you additional victory points at the end of the game. See page 10 for details on how bystanders can be captured by villains. We have read that part already. Important. Cards that say rescue a bystander can't save bystanders captured by specific villains in the city. You have to fight those villains to save those bystanders. This is a very common early mistake and an understandable one. So uh, just make sure you uh, learn that if you don't know it. You can't take them from the villains that way, just from the stack. Or the deck, I guess it is, if there are special ones in there. And if you have what if, you have special ones. But the infinity attack of Gamora versus Ultron, can you only use it once per turn or you can use it once to end the game? Um, so Gamora's card says for one fight. Otherwise, you probably could use it to end the game, but that's probably why that's there. Good question, though. Some special bystanders say you get an extra effect when you rescue this bystander. This could happen because... Uh, yeah, this could happen because you fought a villain holding that bystander or because you rescued that bystander from the bystander deck. 
Some schemes turn some bystander cards into villains and say when you fight one, rescue it as a bystander. She who must not be named. When you rescue one this way, do any when you rescue this bystander effects it has. It counts as a bystander in your victory pile, not a villain. Yep, that's what I just read. Just making sure. All right, wounds. Some cards, comes card effects make you gain wound cards representing your team getting hurt especially badly. When a card, when a player gains a wound, take a card from the wound deck and put it into that player's discard pile. Wounds don't have any attack or recruit, so when you draw wounds in your hand, your hand is weaker than normal. Some card effects let you KO your wounds. Some cards may even turn wounds to your benefit. Wound cards, this is an important paragraph here. Wound cards aren't heroes. Wound cards don't have a hero class or color, not even gray. If a card tells you to KO one of your heroes, you can't KO a wound since wounds aren't heroes. However, if a card says KO one of your cards, then you can KO a wound since wound cards are still cards. One thing it doesn't say here is that wounds cost zero, and it probably doesn't say that because the new wound cards actually have a zero printed on them for the first time, which is great. Maybe it says it later. Healing wounds. If you have one or more wounds in your hand, you can use the ability written on the wound card. Healing. Uh, yep, healing. If you don't recruit or fight anything on your turn, you may KO all the wounds from your hand. If you use this healing ability, you can't recruit or fight any kinds of cards either before or after you use the healing ability. And the, the wound also has updated language to represent this. Uh, agreed, Captain <laughs> Metroid. Healing is often worthwhile if you have at least two wounds in your hand and or if wounds were weakening your hand enough that your turn wouldn't have been very good anyway. You use this healing ability directly from your hand, so don't play the wound cards. Wound cards can't be played. When you have wounds, it's okay to play the rest of the cards in your hand and use some abilities like draw a card to see how your turn develops and how attack many attack and recruit you would have, then you can decide whether to use the healing ability on the wounds, whether to fight and recruit. So it doesn't say it here, obviously, because they're not in the set, but also if you're using special wounds, grievous wounds from the Civil War set, um, you can still, if you have a standard wound, you can rest or heal and KO all wounds, including the special ones with the special conditions. Here we go, running out of officers, bystanders or wounds. If the shield officer, bystander or wound deck runs out, the game continues as normal. If a player would gain one of these cards and there aren't any more left in the appropriate deck, then you just don't gain that card and the game continues. Don't take extra copies out of the KO pile. Don't do it. I'm watching you. Don't, don't, st you, stop. Don't do it. If all the cards in the wound deck are used up, the heroes have taken enough punishment and the game is probably close enough to compete. That's funny. It usually is. Okay. Yep, we're almost there. This is the last couple of pages. Special abilities on cards. Special abilities on cards can override the rules of the game. Some cards tell each player to do something. In those cases, the player whose turn it is does it first, then go in clockwise order. If a card tells you to do something and you can't do all of it, then do as much as you can. For example, if a card tells you to KO two bystanders from your victory pile and you only have one bystander, then KO that bystander and move on. If a card effect calls for a choice and it's not obvious who should make the choice, then the player whose turn it is makes the choice. Revealing a card. Reveal a card just means show the other players that you have it. You can reveal a card from your hand or you can reveal a card in front of you that you have already played this turn. Revealing a card doesn't automatically play or discard that card. You can reveal the same card multiple times in a turn if necessary. Say a card effect has you tells you to reveal a tech card or gain a wound. If you have a tech card in your hand or that you've played this turn, you could reveal it to stop the wound or you could choose not to reveal it and just gain the wound instead. In rare cases, where you have lots of cards that benefit from gaining wounds, you might prefer to just gain the wound. Essentially, if a card says do A or do B, you can choose either option that you can actually do. You can't choose an option that you can't do. Pretty straightforward, right? Reveal the top card of your deck. If a card or keyword effect asks, uh, says to reveal the top card of your deck and it doesn't say where to put that card afterwards, then that card stays where it was, <clears throat> face down on top of your deck. Each hero you played this turn, about uh, this phrase only counts cards you have already played this turn, not other cards in your hand. Your heroes and heroes you have. These phrases include both the cards you have played this turn and the cards in your hand. The heroes in your deck and discard pile don't count. These are very important things that if you're new to the game, might take a while to really understand. But uh, I'm glad this is all laid out here for you to reference. Advanced card interaction details. There's no need to read this section unless you have a particular rules question that you need help figuring out or if you're doing a live stream unboxing and you're kind of um, very curious about how these are written. So, hey, I'm in the second section. Printed attack. A card's printed attack means the number literally printed inside the card's big attack icon. Ignore any plus or asterisk symbols or special abilities on that card. Likewise, effects that say if that card has an attack icon, 
check whether that card has a big attack icon in its lower left corner. They don't care whether or not the card has any small attack icons in its text box. Um, now, I do know that villains that become heroes do also count the new the symbol in the lower right-hand corner and the FAQ that does count for a printed attack or attack symbols. Not printed attack, though. It's the attack icon part. Cards that don't have a number. If a card effect needs to know a number from a card and that card doesn't have that kind of number, use zero. If some scheme shuffles scheme twist into your deck for some reason, a scheme twist doesn't have a cost, so its cost is considered to be zero. All right, last page. We made it. Henchmen are villains. Masterminds are not villains. Henchmen villain cards are indeed villains. Henchmen groups are likewise a kind of villain group. That said, when a scheme says to add an extra villain group, it means a standard eight card villain group, not a henchman group, unless it specifically says to add henchmen. Masterminds are so powerful that they don't count as mere villains. Card effects that affect villains don't affect masterminds unless they explicitly say they affect masterminds. This is an important line right here. The word enemy includes both villains and masterminds. And I'll say that because it's a great all-encompassing term. So if I say enemy, I mean villains and masterminds. A villain gets minus attack. Some cards reduce villain's attack. If a villain's attack goes to zero, you can defeat that villain without spending any attack. A villain's attack can't go below zero. Villains escaping with captured heroes. Some villains like Party Scroll can capture heroes. If a villain escapes with the captured heroes, that doesn't cause any discarding. The captured heroes just stay in the escape pile. Schemes that count escaped villains. Some schemes say things like evil wins when four villains per player have escaped. These count only the villain cards currently in the escape pile. If this includes, no, this includes other card types like Master Strikes or Bystanders that were turned into villains by card effects and escaped the city as villains. This doesn't count villains that escape the city and immediately put somewhere else besides the escape pile. Card effects causing villains to enter or escape the city instantly. Sometimes a card effect causes a villain to escape instantly from the city without the normal process of being pushed by another villain. If this happens, the villain escapes from wherever, whatever space it's in without pushing any other villains out of the city. The escaping villain does all normal escape effects as if it had escaped normally, including KOing a hero from the HQ and causing each player to discard it if it escaped with any number of bystanders. Likewise, if a card effect causes a villain to enter the city at an unusual time and or in an unusual city space, that villain still does his ambush ability. Note, villains only do their ambush ability when they enter the city. If a card effect makes a villain appear somewhere besides the city, like the HQ in front of a player, etc., then it won't do its ambush. Um, I, I lied. I think there's another page. Yep, there's like four more pages. So, <laughs> whoops. They were, it's a new book. They were stuck together. This is important stuff, though. Adjusting difficulty. Some play groups like an easier challenge when introducing new or younger players or if the masterminds have been winning too much. Uh, yep, other groups like to face tougher challenges. One way to adjust the difficulty level is choosing which cards to use in your next game. Masterminds. Some masterminds are intentionally easier or harder to defeat. This is the easiest way to adjust difficulty. Many elements play a role in overall mastermind power level. Learning, learning which masterminds are easier and stronger and the best ways to fight each one is part of the game. Um, by the way, we're going to be working on a mastermind tier list at some point. Then we'll have a little bit of a guide. Um, if you want to check out uh, Grey Warden's grayscale, he's already attempting on his own with a, a quantitative scale. Epic mastermind side. If you're feeling especially confident and ambitious, you can flip over any of the masterminds in this set to their epic mastermind side, which has more dangerous special abilities, master strikes, and attack numbers. These are not for the faint of heart. Uh, Devin mentioned in one of the streams he came by that he really does enjoy putting these epic masterminds together, and I can see why. Scheme. Likewise, you'll, you will find that some schemes are easier or harder to defeat. Some schemes are especially difficult in combination with certain masterminds or villain groups. Again, finding out which schemes are hardest and the best ways to beat the, each scheme combined with each mastermind is part of the game. And by the way, if you would like to help discuss best ways to defeat masterminds and schemes, come to the Discord. That's what we do all day. All right, <clears throat> villain groups. Some villain groups are intentionally tougher than others. For example, the rival overlords are especially tough, while the intergalactic party animals are much easier. The VP of the villains in the group is the clearest signal for which villain groups are harder. And I want to do a tier list of those as well in the future, making the game harder. If you are seeking, seeking even greater challenges, you can try increasing the Mastermind's base attack or increasing the number of Scheme Twists in the Villain deck. A small upgrade here can have a big impact. Optional harder end game, final blow. There it is, what we do here. Some players, hello, like to play with an optional rule that after the Mastermind has been fought four times and has no more face down tactics, a player must still fight the Mastermind card itself in a fifth final fight to put the Mastermind card into their victory pile and win the game. This variation makes the game harder and a bit longer. If your group wants to use the final blow, it's best to make that clear at the start. That's really funny. Uh, 
I have to think that comes from some unfortunate play experience where at the end of the game, they learned, oh wait, we're not done yet. Oh, that's funny. All right, making the game easier. Uh, if you want to make, if you want to give newer or younger players a boost to help them compete with veteran players, or if you want to, uh, some help in challenging an especially powerful or epic mastermind, you can replace some number of these shield agents with shield officers in those players' starting decks, or you can give them a larger hand size like seven or eight cards, or you can agree to reduce the mastermind's attack by some fixed number throughout the game. Good if you're playing with kids or young, especially younger kids. Uh, that can under understand legendary, but uh, might still be difficult for them. I like that. So, uh, who's still here with me? Here, we're going to get to solo mode. And like I said, the, the updates to solo mode are gone over in a really great video by Travel Size. Just uh, search for Legendary Leagues on YouTube. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and read this because there's a significant change to solo mode. There's three significant changes to solo mode here. Solo mode. You can also play Legendary as a single player, competing to defeat each Mastermind and Scheme combination while earning the highest scores you can. This revised solo mode, thanks for the waves, um, overrides and replaces the solo rules in earlier core sets like the core set First Edition, Legendary Dark City, Legendary Villains, and Legendary Marvel Studios Phase 1. Here we go. Solo setup. Hero deck. Use three random heroes, 42 cards in total. Villain deck. One villain group of eight cards. Note, in solo mode, ignore the Mastermind's always leads ability, unless you're fighting an Ultron Infinity. Two henchman cards from the same random henchman group. Oh yeah, let me go back to this. Here's a, here's a change. You add two henchman cards from the same random henchman group. In addition, set aside two additional cards from that same henchman group. Those two henchmen enter the city at the very beginning of your first turn, right before you play the normal card from the villain deck for your first turn. They enter the city one at a time, doing any ambush ability before the next one enters. Um, and uh, Travel went over how if you're using cloning villains like uh, Sentinel Squad 1 or the uh, Sinister Clones, they will clone the appropriate number of times before the game starts. Which is pretty cool. Um, do not use the remaining six cards from that henchman group. If a scheme says to add an extra henchman group, use all ten henchmen from that extra group unless it tells you to use another number. One bystander taken randomly from the bystander deck, five master strikes, and scheme twist, the normal number listed on the scheme. Here is a, another update, extra scheme twist effect. Whenever you complete a scheme twist effect, choose a hero from the HQ that costs six or less and put it on the bottom of the hero deck. That's the same. This helps you avoid heroes you don't want and helps you craft a more focused personal strategy. Without this rule and without other players taking cards in the HQ, you would be stuck recruiting most of the cards that the hero deck randomly served up to you. They do the. I'm reading your comment, Real Firestar. They do their ambushes. Organized crime wave sounds more of a pain than in solo. Yeah, organized crime wave um, is rough with the solo mode, but it's just you know it's just the one. Um, I think I saw that uh, Travel was talking about specifically adjusting the rules of organized crime wave for solo to accommodate these new rules. But that's just one scheme out of hundreds. Is it hundreds? We had hundreds of schemes, or just one hundred plus? Um, I should know this. I think it's a, I think it's almost 200, but not quite. Uh, here we go. Uh, this is the important uh, new part. Note, some scheme twists say things like play two cards in the villain deck, which can cause even more scheme twists to be played. No matter how many twists end up occurring in the same turn, put only, only put one hero from the HQ onto the bottom of the hero deck. This avoids you having to remember how many twists happened, then tucking away multiple heroes in a row. There is no extra effect after a Master Strike. That is the third change. So again, the second change... To reiterate is, if a scheme says, scheme twist says play two cards in the villain deck, you play multiple cards. If multiple scheme twists happen during the same chain, you only will uh, tuck one hero. And the biggest change, which is right here in just one line, there is no extra effect after a Master Strike. Previously in Advanced Solo, after you played a Master Strike, you played another card from the villain deck. Which in a lot of cases, at least when I played Advanced Solo, caused unfortunate chains of strike, and then strike, and then strike, and then or strike to twist. And that was really painful. So now... It just happens as normal. You play the strike, do the master strike effect, that's it. So you have a few more turns in solo that way, which is nice. And you can kind of uh, gauge how long of a game you really still have. Each other player. In solo mode, when a villain mastermind or mastermind tactic tells each other player to do something, do it yourself. Don't do this for each other player effects on hero cards. So just, villain, just enemies. Mastermind abilities in specific villain groups. Since there is only one villain group in a one-player game, ignoring always leads ensures that the villain groups with, which aren't always led by any mastermind will still show up sometimes in solo mode. This also adds variety to different games against the same mastermind. Some masterminds have special abilities and tactics linked to the specific villains they usually always lead. In solo mode, if you don't use the group that your mastermind usually always leads, then apply that ability to the corresponding villain group or henchman group that you are using instead. There are special rules for other masterminds and other sets like Thanos from the Guardians of the Galaxy, etc. 
uh, solo scoring. If you win the game, add up your victory points and subtract these penalties. Minus three for each scheme twist that was played. It isn't in the villain deck. Minus one for each villain in the escape pile. Minus one for each bias center in the escape pile. Write down your scores and which heroes, masterminds, and scheme you used. Compete against yourself, your friends, or the many legendary solo challenge groups on board game websites or social media groups. Hey, that's us. To get better scores against that mastermind and scheme with the same or different heroes. Just a note, any leagues that I think... Uh, yeah, any, any leagues that I do, we don't use this scoring method. So don't subtract stuff. If a form does say on anything that we're doing, uh, how, many, how much VP did you get? Just enter the VP you got. All right. Now we're on the last two pages, because you can tell, because of the credits. Um, here's the alternate solo mode, simulating multiple players. Another way to play Legendary Solo is to simulate two or more players, and then you play each of them. This lets you play the game without any solo mode special rules. You know anybody who does that? I sure don't. Hero types. And this is a cool breakdown that I think is updated. Hero classes slash colors. A card's color is shown in the hero class icon in the uh, card's upper left, and also in the color of the card's border. Each hero has a rare card with no border, but you can still see that card's color by checking the hero class icon on the upper left. Yeah, n only um, only fools, right, Dino Mike? Um, hero class and color are checking the same are the same thing, except that there is a six color gray for cards with no hero class. Strength heroes. Um, tell me in chat if uh, when your class comes up, which hero class are you? Which one best represents you? I want to learn more about you. If you're gray, you can say that right now. Um, no, say that later. Strength heroes, green, include heroes with raw physical power, but also heroes with strength of will, determination, and strong leadership. Strength heroes stand up. Instinct heroes, yellow, using savagery, use savagery and quick reflexes to dominate combats. Some instinct heroes use superhuman senses to get an edge on their opponents. Covert heroes, red, include heroes using trickery and deception to outwit their foes. Some covert heroes also plan clever maneuvers or use superpowers to gain subtle advantages. Mod X is covert. Tech heroes, black, include heroes using advanced technology, advanced weaponry, incredible gadgets, brilliant inventions, or next generation science. And finally, for the hero classes, ranged heroes, blue, unleash massive superpower. This includes bows, projectiles, energy beams, elemental powers, and mental assaults. Ranged all the way for real Firestar. Uh, basic heroes, gray, include all the starting shield heroes and shield officers. They all count as heroes, though they don't quite get the job done as well as high-flying superheroes. <laughs> Evil Weevil, if you're filling out a, uh, a form and it asks you for your security question and it says, what Marvel Legendary Hero class are you? Um, I would like to support that company. <laughs> hero teams. Most hero cards have a team icon in the upper left corner. Um, superpower abilities or other special effects sometimes trigger on team icons instead of hero classes. Tech for Captain Metroid. Guardians of the Multiverse. This unlikely group of heroes was handpicked by Watu the Watcher to confront threats that could unravel every parallel universe at once. And then S.H.I.E.L.D. The Strategic Hazard Intervention Espionage Logistics Directorate is a clandestine paramilitary and spy organization led by Director Nick Fury. It works behind the scenes to stop superpowered villains before they get out of hand. And if I don't win any games today, I can at least be happy that I went through that entire paragraph without making a mistake. Here we go. Here's what's in the box. In case you didn't see it yet, game contents, rulebook, playmat dividers, and 350 game cards. Eight heroes, each with 14 cards, 112 cards. Each hero has one rare, two uncommons, two copies of each, and three commons, three copies of each. The MCU distribution. Five villain groups of eight cards each, 40 cards. Three henchman groups of 10 cards each, 30 cards. Four double-sided epic masterminds, 20 cards, four mastermind cards, and 16 mastermind tactics. 40 shield agents, 20 shield troopers, eight shield officers. Fewer officers than we've ever seen in a core set before, but who needs more officers? 30 bystanders, 25 normal bystanders, and one each of Scott Lang's head, Happy Hogan, Howard the Duck, Howard Stark, and Pepper Potts. Count them, that's, um, that's a lot of Howards. It's two Howards, 30 wounds, four different schemes, 11 scheme twists, and five master strikes. Here are the credits. Here's everybody who helped make this game possible. Give them a thank you. Credits, game design, card design, rulebook, none other than the creative legendary Devin Lowe. Senior brand manager is Travis Ray. Associate brand manager is Corinne Deng. Director of game development is Bubby Johansson. Senior product manager is Mark Shaughnessy. Product manager is Rob Ford. Product development coordinator is Zach Stevens. Graphic design, Chris Timberlake. Project managers, Danny Motejo and uh, Jeffrey Culp. Community manager, Richard. Everybody pour one out for Rich. He's left upper deck, but uh, he's in our hearts. VP of, uh, uh, so has Rob Ford, by the way. Uh, interesting. Uh, this is a collector's item now. VP of production and logistics, Suzanne Lombardi. President, Upper Deck Company, Jason Mosheron. Here are all the playtesters, including some awesome folks who are here, so please give a shout out if and when I say your name. Uh, Mark Beleza, uh, Keith Bingham, Kyle Bingham, J.R. Bontegrer, Emily Cross, Michael Green, Monty Hill, Corey Meese, 
Eric Persons, Aaron Serwa, Jason Walker, and Alex Wigger. Apologies if I mispronounced anybody's name. <laughs> Richard in peace. Mark B, that's Hello Nation. Hello. So there's there's Mark, there's uh there's Corey, aka Captain Metroid, and then Montax as Monty. And then uh yeah. We gotta hunt down all the uh, playtesters, get them all. I need you guys to get the your fellow playtesters in the Discord. We got five now. That's so exciting. All right, and that is it. Except for the quick reference guide. It's everything we just went over, so I won't go over this. But uh, this is really helpful. Uh, use this if you're teaching new people how to play. I do like this at the very bottom, though. Uh, it has the strength, instinct, covert, tech, ranged, recruit, and attack symbols with the key right there. So I do like that. And hey, it only took me an hour and a half. But that is it for the What If rulebook. And now we get to go over the cards. So give me a moment. Yeah, thank you guys for playtesting this set. It looks so much fun. One of the things that makes Legendary so great is the amazing playtesting. Because there's a lot of custom cards out there, and they're really great. I do like the custom content out there. But there's just another level when you have it designed by somebody like Devin and then playtest it as much as it is from the playtesters and with Devin's fixes. So it really shows in this game. Is there any last thing anybody wants me to go over from the rulebook or clarify or have questions about that I might be able to answer? Otherwise, we're gonna jump right into going over the cards. The first mastermind here, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. If you have playtesting insight on this or you just wanna share your thoughts about what you think about these masterminds as I go over them. Let's start with a Hank Pym Yellow Jacket. So Hank Pym Yellow Jacket has a four attack, beefy value of six. Before each time you fight Hank Pym, you must track him down by discarding the top six cards of your deck, then paying two attack for each card you discarded that costs zero. If you don't pay this total, gain a wound and your turn ends. There we go. Always leads any villain group, which is cool. Master Strike. Each player puts three zero cost heroes, zero cost cards from their discard pile on top of their deck. Um, let me go ahead and uh, look at his epic side real quick. Here is epic Hank Pym. Six attack. 6 VP, before each time you fight Hank Pym, you must track him down by discarding the top 6 cards of your deck, then paying 3 attack for each card you discard to the cost 0. If you don't pay this total, gain a wound, then your turn ends. Always leads any villain group, same. Master Strike, each player puts 6 zero cost cards from the discard pile on top of their deck. So, yeah, this is rough. Uru Enchanted on steroids. Um, one of those that is not hard to hit because he has a ton of attack. So this is going to be fun to go through, and uh, I'm going to really enjoy seeing how he works in a randomizer. Let's go ahead and place him here and uh, start to go over some of these tactics. Hopefully I have enough room for everything. He is the master for a moment. All right, and I, boy, I love these shots from the, from the show. Starting with Vengeful Sting. Fight each other player, reveals the top three cards of their deck, discards all those cards that cost one or more, and puts the rest back in any order. Then we've got Save from Assassination. Fight, choose a card from your discard pile that was discarded from your deck this turn. You may put that card into your hand. Third, Revenge for Ancient Grievance. Fight, the player with the most villains in their victory pile and or tied for most gains a wound. I guess that's not too bad. And then finally, Microscopic Research. I love the back road on this. Fight, you may gain a hero from the HQ that costs two or less. But uh, yeah, overall he seems... Uh, he seems rough. I love how the turn just ends if you fail. So you got to be real careful that uh, you're done with all the things you want to do before you fight him because you might fail and the turn will end. Yeah, uh, I like this better than Uru, so I, I hope it... Uh, how I would have to return under a very specific context, right? Because Uru Enchanted Weapons is such a specific thing. Um, all right, let's look at uh, the next Mastermind. Uh, we'll just jump to Killmonger here. So here's uh, Killmonger the Betrayer. Killmonger the Betrayer. Uh, nine attack, six VP. Always include Killmonger as one of the heroes. So I believe this is the first mastermind who has an always include here for a hero. Just something. Um, it says Killmonger. So if you get another Killmonger hero set, I think that would work too. In addition to the one here from What If. Always leads Vibranium Liberator Drones. Master Strike. If there are any Killmonger cards in the city or HQ, each player gains a wound. Choose a Killmonger hero from your hand. Any player's discard pile or the HQ to enter the city as a villain with attack equal to its cost. Plus three and fight KO this or choose a player to gain it. So yeah, the betrayal is real. Let's go ahead and look at what is increased for his uh, epic side. Looks like he's got 12 attack for epic Killmonger the Betrayer. 
Um, same thing for the include and leads. Master Strike, if any, there are any Killmonger cards in the city or HQ, each player gains a wound. Each player chooses a different Killmonger hero from their hand. Discard pile or the HQ to enter the city as a villain with attack equal to its cost and plus four fight KO this or choose a player to gain it. So did the other side say each player because boy, that scales up really dangerously with the number of players. And ouch, yeah, here's the first side again. Um, no, each player gains a wound. So yeah, this is um, the person whose turn it was does it. On the epic side, everybody does it. And wow, that's wild. All right, he looks really tough in solo setups where you have less heroes in the hero deck. Definitely. Um, okay, that's probably why it scales up on the epic side. See you on the flip side, fight. Each other player reveals their hand and discards a Killmonger card, making it harder for you to uh, succeed on his master strike there and by the way i'm new to this set i'm gonna miss things so catch me or i apologize later sunset over wakanda beautiful card fight from left to right each killmonger hero in the hq enters the city as a villain as described on the mastermind card then refill all the empty hq spaces i just realized something if you fight killmonger the betrayer with the house of m scheme you're forced to use his team i think that's interesting uh, pulling the strings, or uh, civil, or um, or yeah, Avenger versus X Men, something like that. Fight! You get plus one recruit for each different villain group in your victory pile. His uh, re referencing his hero set here, and then change in loyalties. Fight! Gain a Killmonger card from the city HQ or another player's discard pile. A lot of Killmongers moving around, so yeah, you can't really play this without Killmonger. I guess you could sub at another hero, but it's gonna be hard to remember who that was as you go and. Uh, He's writing, what is this, the, the War Rhino that he's writing there? I love that. I like this episode. The episode was really good. It was a different sort of flavor of an episode, but I enjoyed it. Going all the way back to the first uh, first movie, Iron Man, to change the story right there was, was wild. Okay, moving on. Who do you want to see next? Well, it's going to be Zombie Scarlet Witch. Here is Zombie Scarlet Witch. She was the mastermind featured in the, um, the championship game of the uh, Gen Con 5K. Here she is, Zombie Scarlet Witch, has nine attack, six VP. She gets plus one attack for each hero with an odd numbered cost you played this turn. Always lead Zombie Avengers in solo mode. If using another villain group, add Zombie to their card names and they all get Ambush Rise of the Living Dead. I would love to hear in chat your favorite zombie villain group names. Just put Zombie in front of the villain group name and uh, I wanna hear the best one because I'll probably try it sometime. Master Strike, cross dimensional zombie rampage, then Rise of the Living Dead. I like Zombie Infinity Gems, that's what I like. All right, let's go ahead and look at her epic side. Here we go. Uh, epic zombie, Scarlet Witch. That's a mouthful. She gets plus one attack for each hero with an odd numbered cost. You play this turn. She's got 13 attack on top of that too. A lot of bookkeeping there, but it should be fun. Always lead zombie Avengers, same deal. Um, Master Strike, cross dimensional zombie rampage. Then each player must soul bind the topmost card of their victory pile that isn't a villain with Rise of the Living Dead, then Rise of the Living Dead. So that's cool. So her epic side does something different. Um, this basically uncovers Rise villains, or tries to do that. That's really neat. I like that a lot. Oh, that's cool. Zombie X-Men 92, I, I do enjoy that. Zombie, um, Zombie Manhattan is also fun. Zombie, uh, Zombie Great Lakes Adventures. Uh, Wistful Illusion is her first tactic. Fight. Before putting this tactic in your victory pile, Rise of the Living Dead. This ability never makes Mastermind tactics for turn. Um, all of her cards say that. All of her tactic cards say that, so I'm not going to read it again, but every single one has that wording. Then, Zombie Murder World sounds brutal. Reveal the top card of the hero deck, then put it on the bottom of the hero deck. You may play a copy of that card this turn. Zombie Illuminati sounds magical. Zombie Radiation Foes. Yeah, zombie Radiation would just be a... <laughs> zombie Illuminati sounds like the name of somebody I probably know. All right, moving on. Refuse to accept death. You may gain a hero from the Kale Pile in addition to the Rise Effect. Then we have the Rise Effect again on even the odds. Plus, each other player reveals the top six cards of their deck, discards all those cards that cost two, four, six, or eight, and put the rest back in any order. I do appreciate Zombie Scarlet Witch. And then finally, oh, by the way, more of Devin's puns, even the odds, because the cards are even. I love it. Chaos Hex. And uh, there's the effect again, the Rise effect. Each other player discards a card with an odd numbered cost or gains a wound. So one even tactic, one odd tactic. There's multiples actually. That's pretty good. Zomtopia. <laughs> Zombie subterranean, they just stay under the ground sleeping. 
Um, zombie Celestials. Why? I know I did that, Cerebrin, because it's perfect. Also, hey, Cerebrin, been a while. Oh my gosh. What happens, though? Um, I guess that's the fun part about Celestials is if you, the zombie Celestials, you, you lose your boon if they rise, right? That's fun. Zombie Deadlands. That's kind of redundant. I don't know if you even... I guess you would technically... Yeah, I guess you would. So if you sub out um, Zombie Avengers, you do have to add the word zombie to Deadlands. So it would say Zombie Deadlands. All right. There's her tactics. Here's our fourth and final mastermind in this set. Probably one of the craziest masterminds in the entire game so far. By the way, after this set, we're up to 96 masterminds. After... Um, I think if we have Ant-Man next, that's three Masterminds. The set after that, we will officially have over 100 Masterminds. Here is the final Mastermind. It is none other than Ultron Infinity, who I thought would be called Infinity Ultron, but this is so much better. Eight plus attack, worth six VP. Every single Mastermind in the set, worth six VP. Zombie Vulture Tech. Ultron Infinity has all the empowered abilities of all Ultron sentries in the city, the escape pile, and stack next to him. Those are henchmen. We'll get to that in a second. There it is again. Always leads Ultron sentries, even in solo mode, so you cannot sub them out for anybody else. Except for very rare situations where the scheme makes you do it. Master Strike, cross-dimensional Ultron Rampage. Then, each player stacks an Ultron sentry from their victory pile next to Ultron. Put this strike next to Ultron as an Infinity Stone. When Ultron has gained five Infinity Stones, plus this card as the Mind Stone, he gets plus Infinity Attack. Solo mode. Also stack a random unused Ultron Sentry next to Ultron. So you might be thinking, this sounds like an epic mastermind already. And it kind of is. But he does have an epic side. So if you haven't seen it, how could this possibly get any worse? I was able to hit it with Infinity Attack for Gamora once it was epic. That's awesome. It must have felt great. Yeah, same. All right. Here's Epic Ultron Infinity. Just the name should make you shudder. 12 plus attack. He has all the empowered abilities of all Ultron sentries in the city, the escape pile, and stack next to him. Terrifying. Same thing about the always leads. Master Strike, cross-dimensional Ultron Rampage. Then each player stacks two Ultron sentries from the victory pile next to Ultron. Put this strike next to Ultron as an Infinity Stone. Solo mode. Also stack a random unused Ultron sentry next to Ultron. Here it is. There's an Ultron Winds effect on this side when he has gained five Infinity Stones. So this becomes, um, once all five strikes happen, um, the game is over. So he's basically Galactus here, uh, <laughs> which is great, but uh, fitting. I, I, I can't have, no, no notes. No notes. That's exactly what it should be. All right. So let's look at his tactics. I think his tactics, by the way, have some of the coolest looking images slash art in this entire set you can tell me if you think you disagree there's transcend morality nope well i guess he does transcend morality but the opposite of it he transcends mortality <laughs> fight search the villain deck and stack the first ultron sentry you find next to ultron shuffle the villain deck next tactic unfettered annihilation look at that rainbow fight for each ultron sentry in your victory pile you may ko a hero from your hand or your discard pile. That's a good one to get. Um, you can get a lot of KOs this way if you land it at the right time. Uh, okay, next one. Those two were great. These are also good too. Struggle for the Infinity Stones. Fight. Gain a hero from the HQ that is one of the hero classes that is empowering Ultron. And the last one is... Infinity of Minions. Fight. Stack an Ultron Sentry from the city next to Ultron. Then each other player chooses an Ultron Sentry from their victory pile to enter the city. So yeah, like Captain Metroid said, you are right. Um, or if you have cards that defeat the Mastermind for free, or if you can use Piercing Energy. But it severely limits what you're able to do. Um, the, even if you can't win, though, the game doesn't end. So you still have time in a League situation to um, try and get as much VP as you can, even though the game's going to go on for a while. Um... A longer losing game is better than a shorter losing game for a league situation. So that's one big difference for me when I think about scoring. Oh, this is fun. Oh, we can't even see it. There's the last tactic. All right, so this... Here are all four masterminds in What If. And uh, I'm going to be fighting every single one today. 
right now, uh, well, I guess you can tell me which one you want me to fight first later, but uh, let's go ahead and stack up all these. There's our masterminds. Uh, I'm going to move on to villains and then henchmen now, because that includes the always leads. But yeah, like I said, strangest always leads ever. So we have Killmonger, who leads a um, henchman and a hero, which is strange. Zombie Scarlet Witch, who leads a regular villain group, but if another one's subbed in, it adds a condition to them, which is interesting. Um, Ultron Infinity, who always leads a henchman, but uh, must always lead that henchman no matter what. And then Hank Pym, who doesn't lead, who leads anybody, and by that he really doesn't lead anyone, you know? So, that's very cool. Love the whole thing. Very interesting for a core set, but I don't think it's too complicated to understand. Which one is the easy one? Um, Playtesters, any thoughts on how you'd rank these from difficulty? Um, from easiest, quote unquote, to hardest? I'm going to guess you have Ultra Infinity at the other end of it, on the, on the toughest end, but I don't know for sure. But I, I don't know if you can. They're all pretty tough. Which I, I love tough masterminds. It's great. All right. Let's look at these villain groups. Now, here's the thing. I haven't uh, sorted these out yet. So just give me a moment to do that real quick. So I'm going to just quickly sort out. There's those. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to go over the basic cards so I can get them out of my way because they're in my way. So here are all the basic cards. Um, let's go over those real quick. First, we have the wound. Here's the wound. A couple of changes on the wound is uh, there's a cost. There's a printed cost, which is zero. Previously, it didn't have a printed cost, but uh, it was effectively zero because it didn't have one on there. And the healing effect is slightly different, too. If you don't recruit or fight anything on your turn, you may KO all the wounds from your hand. So uh, that's pretty good. So Montex says Killmonger, Hank Pym, Zombie, Scarlet Witch, and Ultron. From easiest to hardest, but I'm sure that's pretty relative. Thank you for that. And this is the scene where, uh, from the Captain Carter episode, where the uh, experiment explodes, the uh, super soldier serum uh, operation is attacked. Anyway, so there's all the wounds, and there's a bunch of those. I'm going to set those off to the side. Again, getting them out, getting them out of my way. Here are the standard bystanders from the uh, What If Thor Was Only Child episode. Right? No, 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 wait. Yes? That's from this episode, right? From the uh, party episode. Anyway, bunch of bystanders on there. Looks pretty good. Can't complain. Or is this from a different one? Tough one to place for me. Someone will correct me if I'm wrong. And the Master Strikes. Yep, the party episode. The Master Strikes are really cool. They have uh, Ultron Infinity on them. That is what they look like. There are five of them here. Of course. And uh, love it. What else can I say? And then finally here... Well, not quite finally, but uh, here are the scheme twists. This is probably one of my favorite looking cards in the whole set because the, the image is great. It takes up the whole card, and I'm probably going to keep using these twists over the uh, old ones for a very, very long time. Ah, oh, that's so good. That's so cool looking. If you disagree, I won't ask you to leave, but I'll silently judge you a little. <laughs> that's okay. So cool. I'm going to leave that up just for a second. So I'm going to start with the, uh, the party. So let's start with uh, intergalactic party animals here, starting with Party Kraglin. Uh, this group is fun. They are the uh, all the partiers from that episode, from the Party Thor episode. What if Thor was an only child? Uh, and uh, yeah, here we go. Party Kraglin, four attacks, two VP, fight. You get plus one recruit for each intergalactic party animal in your victory pile, including this one. Love the shot of Kraglin there. We've also got Party Korath, which is funny because in the... Um, there's another villain group that uh, mentions Korath by name and gives him a weapon. That'll work on this one, too. Four attack, two VP party. Korath gets plus one attack for each biostander held among all intergalactic party animals. Ambush. Each player captures a biostander for each card drawn this way. Represents his other effects from his other uh, villain groups. Party Korg. Who else wants to hang out with Party Korg? Just me? Five attack. Fight KO one... A uh, three VP. Fight KO one of your heroes. Escape cross-dimensional party rampage. So you want to load up on these so you can avoid those wounds. Not a lot of ways to get that party rampage. Party scroll. Two attack, three VP. Two plus attack, three VP. Ambush. Party scroll captures the highest cost hero from all the HQ spaces under intergalactic party animals. Party scroll gets plus attack equal to the hero's cost. Fight. Either KO that hero or choose a player to gain it. One thing I love about this set is all the callbacks it does to previous Marvel Legendary mechanics. Because there are a lot of characters who have existed. Korath was one example. Uh, party scroll is another example, representing the. Um, the scrolls from the core set, which is really neat. There's Party Scroll. Moving on to 
Party Nebula. This episode is, is actually the T'Challa Starlet episode, but uh, this version of Nebula probably also likes to party, so it's great. Uh, five attack, three VP, ambush. If there are any other intergalactic party animals in the city, each player discards a card and escape, same effect. Best to clear that city out. Then we've got Party Surter. Uh, Surter's gonna return in the next season of What If, I heard. Callbacks are amazing. Uh, Devin does a great job with those. Six attack, four VP, ambush, cross-dimensional party rampage, fight. You may KO a gray hero from your discard pile. There's a little bit of KO power. Then we've got the uh, toughest two. We have Captain Marvel, end of the party. Seven plus attack, five VP, Captain Marvel gets plus one attack for each other intergalactic party animal in the city and or escape pile. Ambush, each player reveals a strength hero or gains a wound. Escape, Captain Marvel is sentenced to become a new mastermind. She gains the ability, Master Strike, repeat her ambush effect. And uh, just like most of the other, I wouldn't say most of the other groups, but uh, I think one other group and uh, close to the other ones, there are eight cards in this group, of course. Uh, cool. Can I zoom out? Should I zoom out? No, I have a mess everywhere else. And the final one is Frigga, Mother of Thor. 12 attack, 6 VP. During your turn, you may discard a card that costs 5 or more to hide the party and shovel Frigga back into the villain deck. If you do, you may KO one of your heroes, then you must play a card from the villain deck. Ambush. Frigga ascends to become a new mastermind. She gains the ability Master Strike. If there are any intergalactic party animals in the city, each player discards a card. So another ascending mastermind. There's only one of these. This is an important card for the uh, Trash Earth scheme, which we'll see a little bit later. That's the one there's a promo of. And uh, yeah. What do you think of this villain group? Uh, in the uh, rule book, it definitely it says this is the easiest villain group there is. I think that's what it said. It said this one's easy at least. But it looked like a lot of fun. Bit of a lighthearted group. Let's move on to a tougher one. I want to move on to the zombie Avengers. Let's look at them. Starting with Zombie Wong. Korath is looking at me respectfully. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 4 attack, 2 VP, ambush, rise of the living dead, fight, look at the top 2 cards of your deck, draw one of them and put the other back. Very useful general effect. You've also got zombie Iron Man. 7 attack, 5 attack, or 7 attack, 5 VP. Jumping around in, uh, in attack power here. Ambush, each player reveals a tech card or gains a wound, then rise of the living dead. Escape, zombie Iron Man ascends to become a new mastermind, he gains the ability Master Strike. Repeat his ambush effect. Uh, love it. His ambush effect again looks for tech cards. Uh, this image, by the way, is from some of the promo images for What If, and I think it's used expertly here. Let me try to get the lower attack ones first. So there's another Zombie Wong. So there are two of those in this villain group, in case you're worrying about, wondering about distribution. Then we got Zombie Wasp here in her giant form from that episode. Uh, four attack, three VP. Ambush, Rise of the Living Dead. That's a common theme. While in the sewers, rooftops, or bridge, Zombie Wasp is giant-sized and gets plus two attack. Fight KO one of your heroes. Sewers, rooftops, bridge. Alternating spaces as normal. Then we've got uh, Zombie Hawkeye. Still a great shot. Five attack, three VP. Ambush, Rise of the Living Dead. Fight each player, draws a card. Hawkeye likes to draw. His bow and cards in previous hero sets too. There's another one. Two Zombie Hawkeyes as well. We've also got Zombie Doctor Strange. Six attack, four VP, ambush, rise, fight. Look at the top three cards of your deck. Draw one, KO one, and put one back. As Doctor Strange does, not as good as... I don't have that one nearby, but oh boy. That's the best card in the game. Uh, escape, cross-dimensional zombie rampage. Uh, yeah, he's the only villain so far from this group with that rampage. I think he's the only one, period. That's cool. And then we've got Zombie Captain America as the... Uh, he has the most attack, but Zombie Iron Man has worth more VP. Uh, ambush Rise. Zombie Captain America gets plus or minus one attack for each hero class you have. That's a theme from his core set. Uh, hero set. Escape. Each player reveals three hero classes or gains a wound. Very fun. I can't wait to mix these with the Deadlands. Use them with other Masterminds as well. So that's it for these first two villain groups. We have two more to look at. So let me take a second. Stack these up and make some room. I'm going to go ahead and put uh, Frigga on top here as the strongest card in this villain group. And then we're going to go ahead and uh, put Zombie Iron Man on top for the same reason. So we got two copies of Wong, two copies of Hawkeye in that one. Everything else is one of a kind. Next is the... Uh, we'll do Rival Overlords last because I think that's a lot of fun. 
Let's start with these. We're going to go ahead and go with Strange's demons. So if you saw the Doctor Strange episode uh, from the first season of What If, when he was summoning all those demons and binding them to himself, these are all those demons, which is awesome. Imagine a full-on zombie game without the Rise nerf. Uh, don't make me imagine that. Uh, Wolf Demon here. And there are two copies of this Wolf Demon. Uh, four attack, two VP, fight, soul bind, another villain. KO one of your heroes. So again, remember, soul bind means you basically flip over one card in your victory pile. In this case, it's going to be another villain. It says another, so you can't... You do the fight effect again after it goes to your victory pile, so you can't put Wolf Demon there and then soul bind it. It has to be another one. But you could soul bind the other Wolf Demon that was already there. So two Wolf Demons there from that group. All these cards look so good. I want to see more Marvel animated programs, newer ones, so we can just get more legendary sets out of it. Imagine, yeah. Uh, Moose Demon. This is the, I, When I read this, I saw oh, Moose, but that sounds fun. Uh, four attack and two uh, PP. Fight. Soul Bind a Henchman. Draw two cards. You may do that Henchman's fight effect. This is a cool one. There's a lot of useful fight effects. This gives you some uh, KO power. And unlike War Machine, you don't end up KOing the hero. You just Soul Bind it, so you'll get the points at the end of the game still. There's the Moose Demon. Next up, we've got <clears throat> the Skull Demon. 3 VP, 5 attack, fight, soul bind, a bystander. Say that five times fast. Draw two cards. Then, <clears throat> if it's a special bystander, you may do its rescue effect. These are fun because they'll come out of the villain deck at different times, and they all do different things. So each game, again, is going to be different. That's what we love about this. Then we've got the Two-Headed Ram Demon, who look like they have... Um, Dressed up for Halloween, which is perfect. Five attack and three VP. Fight. Soul bind two other villains. KO up to two cards from your discard pile. So you have to do the soul bind, but you don't have to do the KO. Uh, there we go. And um, if you can't soul bind, you do as much as you can. Um, I have to check the rule book for soul bind, but uh, anybody who knows this game, if you can't soul bind, do you still do the effect on them? I have to check on that. Probably in the rules. I just read a lot of things. Demon Dragon. This one I would check. Six attack and four VP. Fight soul by another villain. You get plus recruit. Equal to that villain's VP. That's pretty cool. There's some other cards in Legendary that do that. Um, what is it? The, uh, one of Doctor Strange Avengers cards does that. Uh, escape. Cross-dimensional Demon Rampage. That's a Demon Rampage. Uh, but there's other cards in Legendary that have Demon on them. So that's fun. Then we've got... Two strongest ones in this group. Demon bound Doctor Strange. There's Strange himself. Good for buying a rare. Oh, yes. That's great. Um, so, seven attack. Five VP. Ambush. Each player must soul bind a Strange's demon villain or discard a card. Uh, escape. Demon bound Doctor Strange ascends to become a new mastermind. He gains the ability Master Strike. Repeat his ambush effect. And again, his ambush effect is you uh, soul bind or discard. Discards can be pretty nasty. It's not a card KO, but uh, does nerf what strategy you might have almost had. And then finally, we have Demon Champion of Hydra. Eight attack, six VP. I like that we have a name for it here. Ambush, cross-dimensional demon rampage. Then each player must soul bind a stranger's demon villain. Escape, Demon Champion of Hydra. Ascends to become a new mastermind. It gains the ability to master strike. Repeat its ambush effect. So, that's it for this group. I like this one a lot. Uh, Flavor-wise, it'll fit into a lot of different... Uh, themed setups with demons that you want to uh, create. We've got a couple other demonic villain groups in this game, so it's nice to have another one. Another group of monsters. I love, we like, you know, we're, we're, we play games. We like to fight monsters, and this is a great great way to do that. Okay, uh, moving on to the final villain group in this set, which is going to be the Rival Overlords. And if I'm correct, Rival Overlords has more ascending masterminds in a single villain group than any other villain group in Legendary. Which is a lot of fun. Let's see if I can put these in order. And the cool part about this is, um, if you're playing poker, you have a straight because, what is it? Soul binding is always optional unless the card. That's right. Thank you. Um, it did say that in the rules. Soul binding is optional. So if you can't do the soul bind, then you can't get the effect because it's optional. Thank you very much. So I'm trying to put these in order for you. This has five, six. Wrong way. Wrong way. I'll do it backwards. Five, six, seven, eight. Look at the attack. Nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I love that. Love that. Let's go over them one at a time in increasing attack. Oh, in the Black Order group. Thank you. There are two more. There's so much in this in this uh, expansion. Uh, so let's do the Black Order at the end. 
All right, we got uh, first rival overlord is Arnim Zola Hydra Scientist. Five attack, asterisk, two VP. Arnim Zola gets minus two attack for each other rival overlord that's in the city or the mastermind. Um, I'm not going to read that every time because every single one has that. So they are, that's the rival part of the masterminds. They weaken each other the more that are out there. Fight during one of your turns. You may soul bind Arnim Zola to give a mastermind minus two for one fight. So there's him, followed by Ulysses Claw with the six attack, two VP. He's got the minus two. Ambush, a villain with these in the city with an ascend ability, ascends to become a new mastermind. Happens early. Fight KO one of your heroes. Next up is Yondu. Seven attack, got the minus two, three VP on him. Ambush, Yondu captures a bystander. Fight each player, KOs one of their heroes. So these three don't ascend. But let's look at the ones that do. We've got Red Skull, Hydra Occultist. I'm running out of room here. Uh, eight attack, four VP, got the minus two. Escape, Red Skull is sent to become a new mastermind. He gains the ability to master a strike. Each player reveals a covert hero or discards down to four cards. All right, then we've got Loki, who also has the minus two. He also ascends. He's got nine attack, five VP. If he ascends, he gains the ability Master Strike. Each player discards a ranged hero or KOs one of their non-gray heroes, uh, referencing his uh, Frost Giantness and his uh, Corset Master Strike, kind of. Well, not really, because that is gaining a wound, but uh, mostly the Frost Giant thing. Hey, Owe, thank you so much for the resub. That is 27 months of subs for Owe. Thank you so much. Very kind of you. Um, Red Skull kind of uh, references his other cards too. Ego definitely does here. Um, yeah, he gets minus two. He's got 10 attack. If he escapes, he becomes a mastermind where he gains the ability Master Strike. Reveal the top card of the villain deck if it's a Master Strike. Play it. I guess kind of referencing how he expands the city with his uh, master uh, with his mastermind ability in uh, Guardians. Maybe it's a stretch. But I like it. Because the Master Strikes become the spaces. That's why I say it. Um, rival overlords and a throw in the barons of the battle world sounds painful. Yes. Oh, it does. Here's Dormammu, the uh, second strongest rival overlord. 11 attack. He gets minus two. Escape. He becomes a new mastermind with the ability to master strike. Each player reveals the top card of their deck. If it costs one or more, that player gains the wound, which is 100% a demonic bargain from the Doctor Strange expansion. And then finally, for this group, we've got Thanos, of course. It's quote unquote good guy Thanos, but he's a rival overlord here. 12 attack, minus two. If he escapes, he becomes a new mastermind with the ability Master Strike. Each player discards half of their cards. Round down the discards. I shouldn't have to explain to you the flavor of this one. But that one's fun. Um, try not to let those come out before too many strikes happen. Like you can't control that sometimes. That would be a good setup for Liberate Heroes. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Uh, okay. Sweet. That is it for these two. And there is one more villain group on top of that. Let me go ahead and stack all these up here. So we've got uh, Strange's Demons here. Oh, I forgot. Wait, I just did that wrong. Did you see what I just did? I did the wrong thing. Demon, 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 demon. These are overlords. I did it right this time. Here we go. There's worth the demons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's the overlords. All right, I am totally on track. The final villain group is the Black Order Guards. Uh, and thanks to Off The Cuff's MCU setups, which you can type in exclamation MCU and see all those updates to those setups uh, from What If, I realized there are now three Black Order villain groups. There is the Black Order from Into the Cosmos, there's the Children of Thanos from the Infinity Saga, and then there's this one, the Black Order Guard. So here's Cull Obsidian, not Black Dwarf here, two attack, two VP, empowered by cards that cost five or more, Fight. For each hero in the HQ that costs five or more, you get plus one recruit. There's a lot of empowering here in their group. I do like empower as a mechanic. Nice to see it back somewhere else. So there are two Call Obsidians in this group. The last group had all unique. We've got Corvus Glaive here. Corvus Glaive is three plus attack, three VP, empowered by cards that cost five or more. Ambush. For each hero in the HQ that costs five or more, uh, Corvus Glaive captures a bystander. This is interesting. This one is kind of affected by the uh, Mulligan if he shows up early. Uh, there you go. Dino Mike did it. There's the uh, Off the Cuffs MCU setups. Check those out if you'd like some really well thought out themed setups for not just the MCU proper, but all the shows, all the Netflix shows, all the Hulu things. Every season of that. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, I hope to get back to playing those soon. Uh, Prox of Midnight, 4 attack, 4 VP. Empowered by cards that cost 5 or more. Ambush. Each player discards a card that costs 5 or more or gains a wound. 
Seeing a five or more uh, common pattern here. It's almost like they're reverse worthy. Fight, KO one of your heroes. There's Proxima. There's two Proximas here. There's also a second Corvus Glaive, so two of each. And then there's uh, one each of the last two. Oh no, that's not that's not correct. Three Call Obsidians, two Corvus Glaives, pro two Proxima Knights, and an Embry Ma here in a pair of trees. Seven attack plus six VP, empowered by cards that cost five or more. Ambush each player, discards a card that costs five or more. Escape. Ebony Ma ascends to become a new mastermind. More ascension. He gains the ability of Master Striker. Pete has ambush effect, which again is each player discards a card that costs five or more. So they are nerf city. They're getting rid of your good stuff. So if they show up early, um, they might escape and they're really strong. If they show up late, oh, also they'll be more powerful based on strong cards left that you can't get in the HQ. And if they show up late, they're going to keep making you, um, well, at least Ma will keep making you get rid of your stuff. So. Set the HQ. That's all I can say. All right. That is it for the villain groups. Let me go over the three henchmen in this set. We all love new henchmen. And uh, there's some really good ones in here. Starting with the Giants of Jotunheim as our first henchman group. All the henchmen are worth one VP. These and three attack uh, for two of them. Ambush. Each player discards the top three cards of their deck. Fight. You may KO a gray hero from your discard pile. It's an interesting distinction. KO a gray hero from your discard pile. It's not you may KO one of your cards. It's not you may KO one of your cards or uh, one of your gray cards or gray uh, anything. So you can't get rid of wounds with them. You can't get rid of scheme twists that might become other things. You can only get rid of gray heroes. But um, you can get rid of officers. We have a super giant villain in the first Black Order villain group. Yes, yes, we do. Uh, Dark Memories and X-Gene <laughs> heroes love them. Oh, because of the discards. Yes, 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 yes. And then we've also got um, the Vibranium Liberator Drones. These are what Killmonger always leads. Again, three attack. Ambush. Another villain rescues or captures a bystander. Fight. Liberate three. The next time you rescue a bystander this turn, including this henchman from this henchman, KO one of your heroes. And they make a cool chain. So let's say one drone comes in. Another one comes in. You can give that uh, drone to the, uh, the bystander to the first drone. When you fight them, uh, you get Liberate three, which helps you take down the other drone. So... Liberate's one I'm going to have to wrap my head around, but uh, it's, it's one I think I'm going to forget a lot. I'm going to forget to liberate, but uh, it'll just take time. And now here's probably the coolest henchman group in this set. It is the Ultron Sentries. This is not quite 10 unique cards. It's five unique cards times two. Um, each one gets empowered by a different color slash hero class. So let's start. Here are the tech ones. One thing I really admire about these villains, these henchmen in particular, is that the team was able to find images from the show that represent the colors of the hero classes quite well on five different images of the Ultron sentries. For example, here's the tech one. Empowered by tech, fight KO one of your heroes. They all, all of them have two plus attack, one VP, fight KO one of your heroes, and are empowered by. They're just different hero classes. So this is the tech one. Love the colors there. I'll put that down here. Uh, we've also got the... Ranged one, same thing. Got some blue in there for the ranged. Again, I do love that. Here is the uh, covert one. Shouldn't have to explain that one. That's when they're coming up out of the pit or coming down from the sky. I can't recall, but otherwise, a lot of red. Really cool. Um, the next one is the instinct one. Yup. There's some extra yellow from the lighting from the sun in this one. All the wonderful colors of this show lending themselves to uh, making this henchman group look really cool. And then finally, the strength one which I think is extra clever. So this is from the moment in the show where, again, spoiler alert, if you've stayed here this long with avoiding spoilers, I don't know how. This is from when uh, Zola takes over an Ultron Sentry, and it's the green from Zola. But it is still an Ultron Sentry, and the green works really well with the uh, strength empowered, so I'm not going to complain. But that is it. Those are all five henchmen in this set. Giants of Jotunheim. Or all five henchmen from Ultron Sentries, and then Giants of Jotunheim, Vibranium Liberator Drones, and the Ultron Sentries are our three henchmen groups, which is a ton of fun. All right, that is it for the villains and henchmen villains in this set. Now, Dark Alliance with both Ultrons. Oh, yeah, so much Ultron in the villain deck. That's going to be a blast. So now what? Um, I want to do the schemes at the very end. So I think right now I'm going to do the special bystanders. No, I'm going to do the heroes first, then the special bystanders, then we'll do the schemes. Because, boy, these heroes are not sorted out. 
more henchmen the better. Yep. Uh, I am on the team of I would love to see just as like a special set of just henchmen. Give us an oops all henchmen set. <laughs> that would be fun. We're probably gonna get more in the uh, in the next set in Ant-Man. Marvel Studios Ant-Man. Uh, okay, let's start with heroes. Let me find where Captain Carter is and try to sort out all her cards. So here we go. A small box of 10 henchmen groups, please. They're kind of all mixed up. So uh, give me a second to sort them out and chat amongst yourselves. There's the Watcher. There's so many cool cards here. So uh, in case you don't know, while I'm sorting these out, so Gamora was not really in. Let's start with T'Challa. Uh, Captain Carter just on those cards. So Star Lord T'Challa is there. Uh, Gamora wasn't in this season much. Her episode was cut from this season. In case you don't know, um, it is pushed to the next season. She was in the end of the season because it was, you know, supposed to be a culmination of everybody. So she was there. So all the art on her cards here are from those last couple of episodes, not the cut one. But uh, I hope in uh, maybe a season two box, we get to see more Gamora cards, even though they already made her a hero set. So I don't know how they would do that. Need a henchman group to give it Taskmaster Infinity Attack to get the most out of Gamora. Oh boy. That's um that's terrifying. Okay, I got this in order. Uh there's Gamora. I gotta do you one better. Oh, Doctor Strange Supreme's rare looks so cool. As I like secretly look at it off screen, even though I already kind of showed it to you. Just trying to get these cards together. So there's Star T'Challa. These cards are all together. And there's Captain Carter's rare. Here's the rest of her cards. Okay, I can start going over Captain Carter's cards, I think, right now. Um, ooh, let's go ahead and finish this. I'm, I'm so close to finishing these stacks, so let me just do that. So, more Black Widow, more Killmonger, more Party Thor. Um, just uh, surface level. Any hero that you're most excited to use, if you haven't played this, uh, this set yet. For me, it's Doctor Strange Supreme. I really want to see how he plays. I'm very curious. Because sometimes you can read these cards all day long and you still don't understand how they work until you actually get a feel for how they play, you know? It's a very different thing sometimes. Uh, okay, there's all the Watcher cards. Oh, these are all kind of sorted, so this should be relatively quick, this part. So, here we go. And uh, Killmonger. Killmonger also looks very fun. Alright, I did it. I sorted them out. So, let's move around here. I'm going to show you, Soulbind is very satisfying on Strange, but a limited resource. Yes, I, I imagine so. So it uh, requires you to be uh, very cautious with how much you're spending, spending quote unquote with Soulbind and when. Okay. Let's get this going. Three. There's a lot of cards here, you guys. Just a few. Starting with Captain... Carter, who is not Captain Britain, she's Captain Carter. Apocalyptic Black Widow hits me the most. She looks quite balanced. Yes, I really want to get to use Apocalyptic Black Widow. Didn't get time to really mess with her in Gen Con. Well, I'll try to use her today so you can get a preview, and then I hope you get to use her too. All right, <clears throat> starting with her. So, uh, Captain Carter is, uh, uh, she, her card mechanics are based off of different printed recruit and attack numbers. So let's look at her first card, Wartime Logistics. By the way, every single hero in the set, like you read in the rule book, or I read in the rule book, I, I read it at you, is uh, Guardians of the Multiverse affiliated. This is an instant card, one plus recruit, cost of three. You get plus one recruit for each different printed recruit number among all your heroes. Plus one plus is the same printed number as one. It just cares about the number there. I do like a good recruit card. And uh, if I'm building a Captain Carter deck, I might want to try and focus on getting different numbers, which is not something that you usually think about. But it'll be fun to uh, play a bit uh, differently. This is basically the same card, uh, but for attack, attack plus one plus attack, you get plus one attack for each different printed attack number among all your heroes. And then one plus again is the same printed number as one. Seems like the kind of uh, deck you got to build for. Okay, uh, again, there are three of each common in this set. So each one's got three there. <laughs> what, you don't put villains, you put heroes in the city? Imagine this is a blank slate right here. I'm just gonna put them over here. <laughs> we have an Apocalypse Black Widow and Apocalypse Kitty Pride. One more for an all apocalyptic. Oh, uh, well, I guess there's no actual heroes with apocalyptic in their name besides those two. Um, next up, here's her third common. It is a super soldier serum. The strength card, zero plus recruit and zero attack. No, I just started the Heroes Viral. I've been streaming for two, uh, two hours, 16 minutes. So those who said it was going to take me longer than an hour and a half before I started my first game were right. Glad I started at 2 o'clock. 
So what if you get plus two recruit and plus two attack? And I need to refresh myself on what what if means because it's a new keyword and it's going to take me some time. It's important right now. So choose a hero class or hero name. Okay, then reveal the top card of your deck and either put it back on top or discard it. If the revealed card had the hero class or the hero name you chose, then do the what if effect. So if you have multiples of these, you can have one free attempt that you might fail. The other one should succeed. But two attack and recruit is pretty good. So if you can land this, it depends on how often you think you can get the what if effect. So there's three of these, of course, followed by her two uncommons, the Shield of Britain. Three attack, cost of five, tech card. A lot of deck management out there also, yes. Uh, once per turn, when a player gains a wound, you may reveal this card to return that wound to the wound stack. If you do, the player whose turn it is gets Liberate Three. That's cool. Um, obviously echoing the other shield cards. Shield isn't a physical shield like Captain America's Diving Block, but uh, giving it Liberate. That's neat. And the other one is Give Them All We've Got. Give them all we got is a strength card. Five attack, cost of six. To play this, you must put another card from your hand on top of your deck. And just like Virals have with the deck management, this one sets up what if perfectly for you to never fails as the flavor text. Oh, I didn't read any of the other flavor text. What was what, what wrong with me? Um, this one I didn't read. Was there a flavor text on the villains I didn't read? I don't think so. Right? Just heroes. Um, before the serum, Peggy Carter was a hero. Afterwards, she was unstoppable. I love that line. Very true, very true. And then Icon of Hope is her rare. Rares are still rare here, there's only one of them. Eight cost, two plus recruit, four plus attack. You get plus one recruit for each different printed recruit number among all your heroes. Same thing for attack, you get plus one attack for each different printed attack number among all your heroes. So speaking of which, let's look at all the printed recruit attack numbers. So uh, Car uh, Captain Carter has one, zero and two she has three different printed recruit numbers and then print attack is one zero three five and four she has five different printed attack numbers so if you play her rare and you have all five of her cards just from this one you get four five six seven uh eight attack nine attack because you count the four itself but uh yeah it's very good and plus we probably have other cards there so i am very much looking forward to trying captain carter's hero set and that is her all right who's next all right, I want to hear what you guys think. Shout out to Hero. Who, do, who should we look at next? Should I go in re reveal order? I kind of want to look at Star-Lord T'Challa. I don't hear anything. Nope, Thor. All right, we're looking at Thor. Here's Party Thor. Party Thor, Party Thor. Um, I've heard from people like Travel Size that Party Thor is the best Thor. So we'll be the judge of that. I think he's probably right from what I've seen. So here we go. Forecast says Thunder, his first common. Costa 2, 3 recruit. Love... I. Okay, I'll just, something about me and legendary cards. If the card, it's a hero card that has three recruit on it, I instantly love it. I don't care what else it says. I don't care if it says you lose the game. I love it. That's how much I love cards with three plus recruit on them printed. To play this, you must put another card from your hand on top of your deck. Fair today, storms tomorrow. And again, love the art. One of the challenges for these MCU sets, especially ones with a lot of colors like this, are finding ones that look good with the hero class we're supposed to represent. Um, and boy, I knocked it out of the park here. All right, yeah, ask me your question when it comes up. Thor's card or a copy of the Steam version of Legendary. Oh, are you asking about Core Thor versus the Legendary DXP cards? Then we got uh, Worthy Challenge, a strength card, two plus attack and a cost of three. Whenever you recruit a hero that costs five or more this turn, you get plus three attack. After a life of empty pleasures, is there still time for this Thor to prove his worth? This is a reference to the Worthy mechanic from Heroes of Asgard which cared about having cards that cost five or more. Heroes that cost five or more without actually doing it. So max of five attack, uh, but you have to recruit it here, which is tricky. So not as good as having a card that costs five or more, but we'll see how often you get this to work. But five attack on a three cost is really good though. Are these new skills for Marvel? New skills for Marvel. I'm not sure what you're asking. If you're asking if these are all new cards, they are. There's no repeat cards in this set. Party Thor is not Core Thor. Everything's different. This is not Cap's mechanics. This is not Core Thor's mechanics. Everything is new. Um, Legendary has not repeated, has not reskinned or reprinted cards since Marvel Studios Phase 1. Um, they have not ever said if they will or won't do, this again, do that again. 
but it's the common opinion of the community that they probably will never do that again. We don't know. Um, you did not see these mechanics in DXP though. If you want to go to the DXP wiki and look up what you think you saw, we can compare them, but definitely not these. These are brand new. Um, okay. Did I say wiki funny? Is it wiki? Wiki? All right, here's the third common. This common costs five, again, for the worthy thing. A destructive feast. Strength, again, another three recruit card. I love all these. Oh, let's recruit. Whenever you recruit a hero that costs five or more this turn, reveal the top card of your deck and you may KO it. Um, what I like about this is all the recruit... Uh, party Thor is trying to get more people to come party with him, so all the recruit makes a lot of sense. So for worthy challenge card, uh, I believe it's whenever effect, so you could have eight, even 11 attack from it. Oh yeah, that is a good point. So if you recruit one card that costs five or more, you get plus three attack. But yes, it is a whenever effect. So if you recruited multiple cards that cost five or more, which is hard to do, but with all Thor's recruit, it's not impossible. You could get even more. That's really cool. I didn't catch that, but I love it. Three of those, of course, as well. By the way, I am absolutely loving going over these cards with you guys. So thanks for being here. Thanks for uh, helping make my stream. Not just me talking to the ether. All right, we got Escardian, Escardian, Asgardian Rager, uh, range, three plus attack, and a cost of five. Range, cross-dimensional party rampage. If any players gained a wound this way, you get plus three attack. So this is interesting. Um, it does give out wounds. Um, it is not optional if you do play a range card first. That's how superpowers work. But you can work this out with whoever you're playing with if it's not just you. Um, sometimes you might want them, if even if they have a party card, they might not want to reveal as <laughs> Guardian Badger. I'm pretty sure that, <laughs> that's funny. Um, you might not want them to reveal because six attack might be what you need at the exact point and your fellow player might sacrifice getting that wound for you to really hit something because six attack is a lot. That's basically, that's double the attack here. Thank you for the water, Jolt. Now I'm playing two-handed solo so I can just negotiate with myself, but uh, could make for interesting interactions. Um, okay. I, uh, the other Thor card I put in somewhere else, but uh, I only have one right now, but there's uh, two of these as well. Only Sun, three plus attack. What if you get plus attack equal to the cost of the hero you revealed this way? And uh, cost of six there. Growing up without Loki as a brother, this Thor never learned the pain of sacrifice. Which uh, makes a lot of sense. I like the characterization of this Thor in this episode because uh, having a brother, especially one like Loki, is going to really change you. Attack Six attack on a five cost is nothing to sneeze at. Learn that from Logan. Yep. Okay. And here is Party Thor's rare. It is worthy of the lightning. Five recruit, zero plus attack, cost of seven ranged whenever you recruit a hero that costs five or more this turn you get plus attack equal to that hero's cost so imagine loading up on a ton of recruit and just again this is another one ever so you recruit two cards that cost five one card that costs six that's 16 attack right there plus you just got some good cards so this is really fun i see why this is probably the best thor can't wait to use them either all right folks that's it for party thor who's next oh here's the other only son I'll take a sip of water away, Tommy. So many heroes in this. I hope I have a voice before I start playing the game. <laughs> Black Widow is next. All right. Rio Firestar got it. And Dino Mike would have said the same thing. And I'll do Killmonger next for Captain Metroid. Um, now that you need to know what they're on the card, I think you want everybody to see them. All right. So here's the first apocalyptic Black Widow card. Humanity's final hope. Tech. 2 plus recruit and a cost of 3. If you have at least 4 bystanders in your victory pile, you get plus 2 recruit. With so few humans left alive in this dimension, she was determined to save as many as she could. And you'll see that as a theme here. Uh, what you know about the Black Widow sets other places is that she cares about bystanders, and this is no exception. Um, this is like a version of Savior, in a way, which is interesting. So there's uh, 3 of those. Moving on to another common of hers, which is plant hidden asset. One recruit for cost. Draw a card. You may have a villain capture a bystander short on allies. She needed them in the most crucial positions. I think Black Widow has flavor text on every single one of her cards, which is great for uh, that uh, Deadpool hero set from the Deadpool set. Yeah, she's got flavor text on everything. Um, what do you guys think about this? For four cost, you get one recruit. You get to draw a card and you get to give a villain a bystander. Normally that's just so-so, but with Liberate, it really makes things better. You'll see. I think with Liberate, it's a very high tier. 
We love draw card cards anyway. That's what the little. Uh, that's why it's a little more expensive than other cards that do that. Um, Precision Strike is her third common. Tech, three plus attack and a cost of five. Tech, you get plus two attack. That's good. After Hawkeye died, she used his bow for a final desperate mission against Ultron. The USB arrow of all things. Moving over. Was it the USB arrow or is it that just um? I don't remember. I really don't remember. All right, here's one of her uncommons. This uncommon is cheap. It only costs two. Giving this Black Widow a two cost as well. You can push it down farther in its sleeve. Relentless, it's a covert card. Zero plus attack, draw a card. Yeah, it was his USB. And uh, draw a card, covert, liberate three. When Hulk and Thor died in Ultron's hands, what kind of human could survive? So remember, um, this means you get plus three attack towards a enemy, toward, no, towards a villain with a bias standard or the mastermind, just flat out. So plant hidden asset combos with relentless and it basically gives you an extra three attack. And this card is really cheap too. And it draws even if it uh, doesn't get anything else. But yeah, amazing art on this two cost. Two of those. And then the thing about this set, like the other MCU sets in recent history, um, you can't necessarily plan out for what cards you're going to get all the time because there's so much variety. But these ones I think work best, better together in different combos than definitely Guardians, I think, in a lot of ways. And even Infinity Saga. That's the core of her set along Plant Hidden Asset. Really good though, yes. Um, here is her other one common, the Last Avenger. It is a uh, six cost, three plus attack. What if Liberate Four? It's a tech card um, in a dimension where Ultron won, annihilating most of humanity. One hero still stood against him. I love how her flavor text tells the story as you go along. But uh, yeah, so with Liberate Four, if anybody has got a bystander, um, that is seven attack. Plus remember, it's plus three attack against the Mastermind. So this is plus six against the Mastermind um, if you what if. But it's, I think, an interesting combo of two keywords that we don't see that often. So you only get to liberate four if you succeed on the what if. Um, she doesn't have anything that sets off the top of her deck, though. So you're going to have to get that somewhere else or just be lucky or um, get two of these or, or something like that. But it's powerful. Um, and then let's say six against the Mastermind. I said seven if you liberate four and get three. And then finally, her rare. This is um, familiar. Time to save the multiverse, a covert card, four plus attack, cost of eight, liberate, equal to the number of bias standards in your victory pile. So this is echoing her core set, uncommon, where you can hit the mastermind for basically four plus, if you can hit him for four plus the number of bias standards, great. And then uh, it's easy to give villains bias standards. Yeah, yeah with this with core widow is gonna be out of this world. Uh, that'll be something. She looks like a very fun... She has her own little minigame with the bystanders, so I look forward to trying her hero set, too. And you don't necessarily have to lean all in with her, either. She'll fit into a lot of other sets, I think. All right, those are the first three heroes. I'm going to stack these up now, and I will show you Killmonger next. But um, if this was your solo hero deck, uh, you'd do really well. A couple of what-ifs, um, a lot of recruit power from Thor. Looks like a lot of fun. All right, there we go. We're almost done going over the cards. I can almost finally play the game. <laughs> Vic wants to do a bystander rescue kidnap heavy game. If you do, post it in the in the setups uh, forum so we can hear how it went and see your setup. All right, see how much damage we can pump out. It'll be a lot. It won't be infinity damage. I'll tell you that much. It'll be close. Um, okay, let me put the rares on top just for aesthetic purposes off to the side here. All right, let's go ahead and look at Killmonger Special Ops. Uh, he is in the category of the villainous heroes, which I do enjoy, but he is on this team because the Watcher did recruit him. So, this is his only multi-class card, unlike Star-Lord T'Challa, I believe. Um, he's got, uh, this is a strength tech card, one plus recruit, and a cost of two. You get plus one recruit for each different villain group in your victory pile. Learning new patterns, planning the attack, pouncing for the kill. And yeah, he does care about um, villain groups in your victory pile. So remember, a uh, henchman group is a villain group. So this will scale up with the number of players because with the number of players, you have more villain groups. And again, for four and five players, the number of villain groups has increased permanently. Um, there's certain schemes that increase the number of villain groups, including in this expansion. And there's a core set, actually. So um, Killmonger, if you're playing with three, four, five players, you might want to bring Killmonger along because he just gets better. Which is a neat. I don't think there are there any other heroes that scale better the more players you have. 
maybe uh maybe ones with blood frenzy maybe but uh that's pretty cool i think all right uh we got uh no matter the price tech two plus attack cost of four tech strength you get plus three attack obviously it can be triggered off of a single hunt new prey card because of the dual class this is just um a beefy one reminds me of hulkbuster iron man in a way then we have our last common a more expensive common it costs five I think all the heroes have a similar cost distribution, if I recall from the uh, the breakdown. And by the way, if you do want to see these cards at any time, you can go to legendarycardgame.com. Captain Mentorica has got scans of all of them up right now. So if you want to leave and go look at those and not listen to my voice, you can do that too. But I will start playing game very soon, I hope. Right? So we got uh, Violence Leaves Scars, a Strength, 3 plus attack, cost of 5. Strength, you get pl plus 1 attack for each different villain group in your victory pile. What kills them makes you stronger. So normal games 2-ended solo, you will have potential for three attack because two villain groups and a henchman group but still six is very good even in solo it's good um, one henchman one villain group that's five attack for five still pretty good illuminati beast looks like a cool pairing with killmonger oh yes definitely definitely oh, those two and um and hulkbuster iron man together oh can you imagine all right let me just get some of these back out here there's three copies of each one of these here's the first uncommon it is the cheaper one hostage rescue strength two plus attack cost of three what if liberate three just like black widow another what if liberate combo as far as i can tell he doesn't have a top deck set up so you're gonna have to figure that out saving tony stark from the 10 rings sent jaka's whole life in a new direction i'm not sure how i feel about this one um if you can get the what if it's great but again um he can't really set it up himself but everything again everything's been tested so there's reasons why everything's got everything it does here is plot of betrayal plot of betrayal is a second uncommon tech four plus attack cost of six each villain worth three vp or more captures a bystander tech liberate two this sets up liberate real well sure he's betraying us to help them but it's just so he can betray them back to us right so this is great with widow because this can set up a lot of things um one of the funny things about liberate and the cards that give bystanders to enemies does not play nice with hunt for victims which is a very niche condition but i would love to see this combined with hunt for victims and see who get the bystander first um it reminds me of sinister six venom yes 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 um villains venom can give bystanders to villains that's a comp complicated sentence but if you know what i mean you know what i mean what will help with liberate and finally we've got i'm the king baby strength four plus attack cost of seven you get plus one attack for each different villain group in your victory pile and then strength liberate two for each mastermind tactic in your victory pile which is great on its own but imagine using this with something like um the master of tyrant scheme or um additional actual masterminds uh secret wars well secret wars i get two each yeah that would work well um world war hulk uh, final blow yeah yeah for the final blow you'll have all four tactics um if you were the one if if you weren't playing solo and you were the one to get all four tactics that's really good uh that's a really good rare yeah but uh and the, the art and it's great too all right that is killmonger special ops we have a few more heroes to get through shout it out who we see next let me know my chance to drink some water utah watcher of the midwest all right, well, look at the Watcher. I think that's what you meant. <laughs> All right, here's the Watcher's hero set. So I'm gonna be uh, I'm gonna be clear. I think I don't know how I feel about the Watcher's hero set from what I've seen. It doesn't look as interesting or strong as the other ones, which kind of works because the Watcher is not supposed to interfere that much. But maybe I'm just missing something. I gotta try playing with him. But uh, let me know what you think. I love to hear what the testers think too. I could be just way off base because again, I haven't played with him yet. So here's the Watcher. Another dimension crumbles. Covert. Two recruit and a cost of three. What if you may KO a card from your hand or discard pile? Merely standing and watching as Ultron conquered so many dimensions soon became unbearable. He's got a lot of what if. I do like the way he empowers though. Um, his other card, uh, other common, break the oath. Range. Two plus attack, cost of four. What if you get plus two attack? The Watcher swore a sacred bond never to interfere and only to observe a bond he has kept until now. I love how this card has his armor from the fight against Ultron Infinity. The Battle Armored Watcher. Third common is a cheap one. Two costs, Diverging Time Streams. Covert, one plus recruit, cost of two. Draw a card, then put a card from your hand on top of your deck. Covert, you get plus one recruit. This one sets up the what if. A single choice can branch out into infinite realities, creating alternate worlds from the ones you know. 
So yeah, this sets up what if probably more than any other card that I've seen in this set so far, which makes sense because he's the watcher. And when he does stuff, he can actually do a lot of stuff when he does the things. For his uh, adventure path, we were just talking about uh, what if, no pun intended, you put in setups where he's not actually in the setup, like he's in the perfect wedding or he's in the, uh, he's in like the Hulk deck or whatever, I don't know. Um, here's one of the uncommons. Anoint a champion. Covert, two plus attack at a cost of five. Covert, choose a hero name. You are empowered by that hero name. If Watu could not intervene directly, perhaps he could sway a mortal to do what must be done. Now, this card is one that works better the fewer players you have. But it mostly is a big jump between solo, everything else, then five player. Because in five player, you got six heroes. Some schemes add other ones. If you're playing true solo, you've only got three different hero names in the hero deck. It's going to be harder to trigger that on two two player but uh sometimes you do end up with one hero that's just in the hq five times and that will work really well with uh watu here played two games with him and never saw that card pop up yeah that's the cool part about this card distribution is you might just never see a card and it's uh, an uncommon or even a common um here we go with <laughs> travel's gonna come back in here like at the top of the hour and be like well i knew you still didn't start any games yet <laughs> History repeats. Ranged. Three plus attack. Cost of six. Ranged. Soul bind. You get plus two attack and you may do that villain's fight effect. That's cool. He watches mortals make the same decisions over and over for good or for ill. There's a ton of villains across this game that have really beneficial fight effects. So history repeats. Targeting that villain's fight effect and doing it again is great. Um, I like it a lot too. So I want to ask this question if anybody has an answer. If you're fighting the Celestials and they're on your victory pile, if you soul bind them, do you no longer have the Celestial boon? I would assume yes, because they are no longer visible. Just wondering. And then finally, Convoke the Guardians. Yep, that's what I thought. All right, Convoke the Guardians, his rare ranged five plus attack, seven cost what if choose a team for example guardians of the multiverse x-men or avengers you are empowered by that team level x-men got a mention and it came in before the avengers here uh, this is interesting this cannot work with unaffiliated heroes plus you're more likely to have teams in common than hero names in common but it's already five attacks so that's pretty good um even if you have just one team one card from that team, which is not very common. Usually you'll have two cards of the same team. So seven attack, which is a little low for a, for a rare, uh, but you could get up to 10, which is really good for a rare. So who knows? What's up, Tricky Vic? That is it for the Watcher. We have one, two, three more hero sets to go. Who are we looking at? Who's next? Okay. I'm going to stretch back here for a second. I've been sitting for a while. <laughs> T'Challa, Star-Lord is next. Sorry, Star-Lord, T'Challa. I should do this with all... I mean, I plan to do this with every single set that comes out uh, going forward. But this is a big set. <laughs> um, maybe I can go over past sets if I have the inkling to do that. That sounds fun. All right, so all of Star-Lord T'Challa's sets, like other Black Panther sets, are multi-class. All the cards are multi-class. Let's begin. He has every single class represented in his hero set at least once. Here is Interstellar Adventures, Covert Tech, 2 plus Recruit, and a cost of 3. What if you get plus 3 Recruit? On Earth, a noble king, in the stars, a charming scoundrel. Loki's dog says 15 attack if Ego gets all his master strikes out. Yeah, for stuff in the city? Uh, oof. Love multi-class cards. It's a lot of fun, yeah. I, I love the multi-class cards too. Um, I think they've been done better each time, so... They, they were really well done in um, Black Panther, and then we saw them in Infinity Saga, and now here. So yeah, this is great, by the way. This is five recruit for a cost of three. All you gotta do is get that what if correct. And all you need to do for that is get another what if to uncover it. If it's not gray, not a zero cost gray, you can get this. And five recruit is wonderful. That's a lot of recruit. Plus the multi-class can trigger things we got plan the heist instant covert to attack cost of four look at the top two cards of your deck discard a number of them and put the rest back in any order this sets up that what if really really well two cards that work great together and by the way notice how there are no actual 
hero class superpowers here. Here's the first one. It is fight or flight. Strength covert. Zero plus attack, cost of two. Choose one. You get empowered by strength or you get empowered by covert. Then, strength covert, draw a card. Nice to have that option. It's a really cheap card. Doesn't really give you much as far as attack and recruit on the surface. But with his hero set, you can probably get this card draw, but uh, less likely because there's only three of these. But you could get the classes other ways. Probably an easy pickup, even though it might fizzle. It might not draw a card. I like it. Uh, there's another plan, the heist. We've got uh, one uncommon. Unexpected exit, even though this is a... Uh, him in a very small form because this is when he got abducted. I do like the art. Uh, strength Instinct. Three attack and cost of five. What if you may KO a card from your hand or discard pile? Kidnapped by Yondu's Ravagers. One path of adventure replaced another. So that's really cool. Love the KO power. It's locked behind what if, but he has good ways to get there. We got uh, Cross the Multiverse Star T'Challa. Strength ranged. Attack of four, cost of six. What if you get empowered by the hero classes of the card you revealed this way? This is cool. So if, uh, uh, yeah, a little bit of wound management. So you can use plan the heist, um, set it up so that you can get a dual class card on top and then play cross the multiverse and get empowered by two different classes. And you can kind of set that up so you can get empowered by the classes you want to based on the HQ, which is neat. And then finally, here is his rare. It is Colliding Dreams. Tech ranged, four plus attack, cost of seven. Choose any number of heroes in the HQ, put them back, put them on the bottom of the hero deck, and then you get empowered by multicolored cards, which is interesting. You don't get empowered by a single hero class. It has to be a multicolored card. This will count divided cards in the HQ because they are both the hero classes. And I don't think there's a single divided card that has two hero classes that are the same on each side. So this counts straight up multicolored cards. It counts divided cards, uh, maximum of nine attack with a regular HQ. But it does do a real good recycle or HQ cycle for the rest of his empowerment. Also can help with some of the enemy's empowerment if you're really trying to move things out of the HQ. So um, fun. There we go. All right. There are almost all the heroes in this set. There are two more. Who are we looking at next? Gamora or Doctor Strange as I stack these up? Very solid. I am having a lot of fun going over these with you guys. Who's next? Crunchwrap Supreme. <laughs> oh wait, that just made my day. Yeah, it's hard not to think about the fact that Doctor Strange Supreme sounds like the number 17 combo, but uh, I do like it. All right, let's look at Strange. Then we'll look at Gamora because she has Probably the wackiest rare out there. All right, so Doctor Strange is going to start with Seize Infernal Power. Two plus recruit, cost of three, instinct card. Instinct Soul Bind. You get plus recruit equal to that villain's printed VP. These demons do not bargain. Their power is not granted. It must be taken. Yep, no demonic bargains here. You just take it. Tricky effect, you're making me hungry. I'm going to have to get some food during the stream somehow. I'll figure it out. Uh, there's, there's services for that. When you put your hero's cards that always in storage, do you place the rare at the front? No. Um, not unless I had a storage where you could see the rare card. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. I just pulled them out anyway. Um, okay, so yeah. So, Doctor Strange's set is all about soul binding, flipping cards over in the in the uh, victory pile. Speci uh, specifically villains. And uh, getting stuff from that. So, he is a limited resource hero. But that's fun. I do, I do like that. Okay, next up, we have... Two more of those. Here is uh, another common summon demon. Whoa, summon demons that knock my camera out of the way. All right, summon demon minions ranged two plus attack at a cost of four. Soul bind. You get plus attack equal to that villain's printed VP. Why do your own fighting when you can have demon dragons do it for you? There are a ton of villains with high printed VP. And again, it's nice because you don't have to KO that villain. You just uh, temporarily turn it face down until the end of the game. So no risk to really doing this at the right time. Imagine with the Acolytes, the ones that you shatter from Messiah Complex that have like 10 attack, 12 attack on them. Oh, man. Other than me, I love that we both have it, though. It works. I guess that would be one of those things where you'd both kind of need it to help each other out. Uh, hopefully not too much enabling. Okay, Wars of the Vashanti is his third common. I love this art. Uh, range, 3 plus attack, cost of 5. What if you get plus 2 attack and you may KO a wound from your hand or from any player's discard pile? There's some wound KOs just straight up. Wound KOing. 
And you don't have to do it if you don't want to get rid of the wounds. Uh, but you do have to hit the what if to do that. I can I can see this one not being that impressive if you don't land the what if. It's just three attack for five. Plus, it also specifically just KOs wound, but you wounds. But you can help other players with it, which is a rarer effect. Usually, you just get rid of your own wounds. Then, we've got the uncommons. The first one is a cheap one uh, to save Christine. Instinct zero plus attack, cost of two. Draw a card, which is great. Can't clog your deck. And then instinct soul bind. Um, a bias dinner or villain, you get plus two attack. If it's a special bias dinner, you may do its rescue effect. You get to actually choose this. So, um, what happens if you soul bind Amy this way? Soul bind uh, the shape shifted copycat. You put her face down in the victory pile, and then she enters the city face up. And then you can fight her and just keep doing that. She doesn't go back to your victory pile soul bound. I don't know. Yes, real Firestar is right. Um, every single version of Doctor Strange's hero sets can complete the Grand Ritual. So, this is no exception. Can you recycle the copycat this way? I mean, if you want the KO power viral, I would. Especially because you can choose. Or does she soul bind first, which means she has no text and can't come back. But that, but this implies that you can use the, uh, the text on it, so I don't know. This is one of my favorite pieces of art in the entire set. Break the absolute point in time. Instinct. Whoa, Jolt! Grab, Grab some, some I absolutely will. Thank you so much, Jolt, for the support. I've been going for a while, so that is very, very much needed. I do appreciate that. Oh, man. Did that play twice? <laughs> That's one of the sound effects I didn't test, but enjoy that. Thank you so much, Jolt. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna check on that after I finish going over the overview. Um, all right, so let me read this card. Break the absolute point in time. No printed attacker recruit, and uh, six cost. Reveal the top three cards of your deck. Draw one of them. KO one and put one back. Yearning to save Christine Palmer's life, drove Strange to do the forbidden and the unthinkable. This is such a good card. Um, nothing printed. Does cost six, but it sets up what if. Particularly in this in this set, it really helps uh, because of that. And you get to do a KO, but you have to KO one, so you take a bit of a risk there. I like this, but here is his rare, which is awesome. That was very kind, Jolt. Thank you so much. All right, here it is. Stygian Communion. Instinct. Cost of eight, three attack. And then Instinct Soul Bind. Draw cards equal to that villain's printed VP. Was Strange stealing the demon's souls, or were they stealing his? So you can basically get a whole second hand of six cards with a lot of villains that are out there. There's plenty of villains in this expansion or this core set alone that have high printed VP. Even if you just soul bind a, um, a henchman, it's, a, it's an extra card draw, but you're probably going to get more. That's cool. Again, these are based off a limited resource, but if you can keep destroying villains or defeating villains, uh, you can keep using them. You're going to have to coordinate this with your, with your uh, other game mates, I suppose, to make sure that you can take out what you need to fuel Doctor Strange's soul binding. But oh, this looks like so much fun. All right. Are you ready to see Gamora, the story of Thanos? Because it is time. I think she is the only one. Was she? Did anybody else have a two cost common? Did Black Widow have that? Anyway, she has a two cost common. Assassin Stealth. Gamora does a lot of card drawing, like she does in the other sets. But she could solve mine a tactic. Um, yeah, I guess. But uh, there's plenty of villains to take care of. Doctor Strange can easily counter Ultron Infinity, from what I'm seeing. He can soul bind his henchmen and avoid his empower. <clears throat> sure. Uh, fitting since he was carrying that episode. Yes, he's Doctor Strange. I had that card our last game and couldn't find, get a yellow with it the whole time. The whole game. Oh, that's frustrating. Um, I want to see how I do with him today. Anyway, here's Assassin Stealth. Covert. Zero plus recruit. Cost of two. Draw a card. Covert. You get plus two recruit. Simple. Easy. Death steps softly. And again, these are all images from the last two episodes. But uh, with what they had to work with, I think they did a really good job. Putting those together. Here is another Covert Common, Tactical Insight. And again, there's three copies of each of these commons. Uh, covert, one attack, three cost, draw two cards, then put a card from your hand on top of your deck. Identify the weak point, then strike without mercy. Once again, setting up draws and specifically what ifs. Here is her third common. It is Wield the Blade of Thanos. Instinct, plus one plus attack at a cost of four. You get plus one attack for each card you drew this turn. Time to cleave a new legacy. Play this at the end or near the end of your turn, and that is a lot of attack. If you had one, one of each of these so far, that's one, two, three. 
Um, that would be one attack, two attack, five attack with three cards. And some extra cards drawn, which could do other things, which is really good. Gamora looks like a powerhouse, and we're not even to the uncommons yet. Here is one of the best card names, and I think you'll agree with me, in all of Legendary, Titanicide. It is a covert card, two attack, and a cost of five. What if draw two cards? More card drawing. Killing Thanos is enough to earn a pretty badass reputation. No kidding. Um, I loved how they used the image here from the promo images because she's in limited shots, but that's great too. It looks awesome on this card. Then we got Destroy an Infinity Stone. It is an instant card, attack of three, and a cost of six. Instinct soul bind KO a card from your hand or discard pile. They said it couldn't be done, but Gamora found the way. So she uh, sacrifices a villain in a way to KO another card. I like that trade off. And uh, this is a nice thing to soul bind henchmen for because you should have a lot of them and they're not, uh, you know, hanging around for much else. And then finally, here's her rear. Are you ready? The Infinity Crusher. Tech. Five plus attack, cost of eight. And Guardians of the Multiverse Trigger, Soulbind, six villains. You get plus infinity attack, usable only for a single fight to infinity and be gone. So this is basically a free hit on most any Mastermind, and it is the only way you can hit Ultron Infinity on his uh, non-epic side in this set, because I don't see any defeat a villain for free, a Mastermind for free. But uh, Infinity, it takes Infinity to take down Infinity, so you're going to need her if you have Ultron Infinity and uh, a lot of those strikes come out. She's so good. I don't know if she's the best, but she's definitely a candidate. All right. We are almost done with the cards in this set. That's it for Gamora. But let's go ahead and look at some more. Funny how even with Infinity Attack, you can't hit Indestructible Man. Yes. Oh, an Indestructible Man is awful with Soulbind. Um, because if, if you Soulbind too many Elite Assassins, you can't defeat Indestructible Man, which is really funny. Um, anyway, I want to quickly go over a couple cards I didn't talk about, which were the Agent and the Trooper and the Officer. So we've got uh, Coulson first as your Shield Agent. Um, looks pretty good. The darker cards kind of can put a glare. You can see my camera up here, but uh, it looks really good in person. And then you got the Shield Trooper, which is Maria Hill. I'm definitely going to switch to using um, these on one side and then this, the core ones on the other. And then finally, we've got... Fury as the Shield Officer, and these all look great. I'm very happy we got not no, only new starter cards, but Shield ones that have illustrations basically on it, right? Even though they're shots from the show. I really didn't like, I, I mean, I don't mind you mixing the photographic cards mostly with the illustrated, but the, something about using the starters was a little bit odd to me, but uh, this is great. Yeah, she should be the trooper, right? So those are the three starters. And then I'm gonna go over the schemes. Let's go over the special bystanders real quick. And then we'll do the schemes, and then that is it. And uh, I get to start the stream after that. Are you excited? I'm excited. So <laughs> we got five special bias standards, starting with Happy Hogan. Here we go, bias standard. When you rescue this bias standard, reveal the top card of the villain deck. If it's a Master Striker scheme twist, you may shuffle that deck. Uh, referencing his hero set from Spider-Man Homecoming, where he can KO Master Strikes. Um, I like this. That's Happy. Next up is uh, Howard Stark. Howard Stark, when you rescue this bystander, reveal the top four cards of your deck. Draw each tech and range hero you revealed. Put the rest back in any order. Interesting because it refer refer uh, references the Iron Man hero classes, tech and range. Like a prototype of that, so I like that. Thank you, Tricky Mac, for the water. Next up, we've got Pepper Potts. Who already has a bias standard, kind of, which is a copy of the um, one of the one of the uh, other special ones. Anyway, when you rescue this bias standard, you get plus one recruit if the bank is empty and plus one recruit if the rooftops are empty. I think referencing that one, if I believe, uh, if I uh, remember correctly. So, luckily, it's not the sewers. It's a good chance at least one of these will be empty if you rescue him. That one extra recruit could go a long way. Then we've got Scott Lang's head, which I'm very happy to see as a special bystander. When you rescue this bystander, whichever player is ahead, has the most VP or tied for most, may KO one of your cards. No notes. Amazing. And then finally, Howard the Duck. There he is. When you rescue this bystander, reveal the top four cards of the bystander deck. 
you may rescue a special bystander from among them, then put the rest back on the bottom of that deck, referencing his hero set. Uh, right? Yeah, I think so. His Howard the Duck hero set from Dimensions and uh, Marvel 3D. That's cool. All right, that is it for all of these cards. Now it's time to go over the schemes. Let me go ahead and stack up these uh, heroes. Read you all four schemes, which for some reason, I'm going to read to you again when it's time to play them. The reason is because those will be different videos. But don't tell anybody watching that video that you're in a different video. Can't have any sort of uh, cross-video awareness going on. Got to keep things under control. All right. Let's look at these four schemes. Um, here is Trash Earth with hugest party ever. Here is the promo from Gen Con that Upper Deck uh, was very generous to send me. And um, Ollie and Kyla also sent me some of these, and they're on the promo wheel. <laughs> Say hi to YouTube, yes. So let's go ahead and look at it. I'll use the promo version. Here it is, Trash Earth with hugest party ever. Set up six twists. Always include the Party Thor hero and intergalactic party animals villain group. Twist. If Frigga, Mother of Thor, is in play, stack this twist next to the scheme as discovered wreckage. Otherwise, search the villain deck for Frigga and she does her ambush ability. Then shuffle this twist back into the villain deck. Special rules. You can't fight or defeat Frigga. Evil wins when five wreckages have been discovered. So, um, by the way, here she was. Here's Frigga. So, uh, once again, during your turn, you may discard a card that costs five or more to hide the party and shuffle her into the villain deck. Um, so that's the only way you can get rid of her in this situation. Uh, it's going to be fun. This was this one was our win, and it was fun. I look forward to playing this one for sure. I do have that promo wheel if you do want to try and win that one. Okay, next scheme is the other one we saw at the uh, at Gen Con in the uh, final table. Marvel Zombies. I had heard from the playtesters that this was a scheme they have been working on for a while. So I'm glad to see it. Uh, set up four twists, include exactly one villain group with Rise of the Living Dead. Add eight random cards from an extra hero to the villain deck. Twist or one to two players, add three extra bystanders. Special rules, hero cards from the villain deck are zombie villains with attack equal to their cost plus one, worth VP equal to their cost. They have ambush, Rise of the Living Dead, fight, play a copy of this card as a hero, then put it into your victory pile as a villain, it still has Rise. Twist. Each villain in the city with Rise of the Living Dead escapes. Then play another card from the villain deck. Evil wins when there are three villains per player in the escape pile. Or the villain deck runs out. And of course, Rise is going to push things through the city, which is going to make it more likely that things end up in that escape pile. So um, this is going to be fun. Um, you get to uh, make a zombie. So which zombie hero do you think would be fun to throw in on this? Um, once again, you fight it, you play a copy of it as a hero, then it goes into your it, it stays a zombie so it's still a zombie in your victory pile so which hero would, would be fun to throw in here from outside the set uh for another time you can tell me oh the deadlines will be fun as a villain group um imagine um zombie warriors 3 would be kind of fun um zombie i uh, use, use a zombie watcher from here you could do um zombie Psylord. what's a what's a better one there's got to be a better one um, zombie Heralds of Galactus. Oh, that would be so much fun. Okay, let's go. Next scheme is collect an interstellar zoo. I've got to think that the collector's coming in another set, right? Zombie Ancient one looks great because the collector didn't wasn't a mastermind here. This card says collect on it, but it's an image of T'Challa Star Lord. Um, I don't know. But this looks fun. Set up 11 twists. Twist. Each player reveals their hand. Starting with the current player, then clockwise, the first player to have one of this kind of hero in their hand or discard pile stacks it next to the scheme. Stolen for the zoo. Twist 1 is a strength card. 2, instinct. Twist 3, covert. Twist 4, tech. Twist 5, ranged. Twist 6, 5 cost. Twist 7, 4 cost. Twist 8, 3 cost. Twist 9, 0 cost. And twist 10, recruit icon. Twist 11, attack icon. Evil wins when the zoo has five heroes. I had heard that this one is deceptively difficult. So I'm going to watch myself before this. You lost a twist seven. Yeah. Um, I don't know how you kind of control. You got to make sure you don't have too much of everything, I guess. With the cost, it's very hard to control that. This next scheme looks wild. It has another piece of my favorite art from this entire set. The scheme looks like it's one of the most fun schemes in Legendary. 
Breach the nexus of all realities. Set up. One to two players use three villain groups. Stack each villain group separately face down as its own reality. Add two twists to each reality. Shuffle together all the henchmen, master strikes, and bystanders for your player count and randomly distribute them among all the realities as evenly as possible. Shuffle each reality separately. Special rules. Each turn, you choose which reality villain deck plays a card. They all play into the same city. Twist. Stack this twist next to this reality as a dimensional breach. If this was the second breach for that reality, destroy that reality, KOing all its cards. Evil wins when all realities have been destroyed. So this is cool. This one kind of scales based on how many villain groups you've got. So you use three for one to two players. There's masterminds that add villain groups. There's other situations that can do that um, and keep the realities going. Um, I love the scheme with different villain groups like Silo Ruby is going to be great with this one. Um, it has the potential to be my favorite scheme in all of Legendary. I cannot wait to try this. I can't wait to see when it comes up in the randomizer to see what uh, jumps in there. Um, I was thinking about doing one with... Um, Avengers from Villains, Zombie Avengers from this set, and then Manhattan. So you can have three actual different realities of Avengers coming in, which would be kind of fun to do. But, oh boy, do I want to try this one. And that is it. We did it. It only took me three hours, but we went over every single card in What If. So I hope you guys had fun. Thanks for sticking around. I'm going to be playing some games, so don't go anywhere if you can, uh, if you can stay, because I'm going to start playing some stuff. But if you're watching this on YouTube, thank you for watching this overview. Um, if you like this kind of stuff, please hit the subscribe button. It helps keep me uh, doing this kind of thing. And uh, I will see you guys on YouTube next time. Go enjoy this set. Let me know how it goes in the comments.